where the Caribbean imagination embraces the world. This two-day launch is also a very special nod to the Virgin Islands Literary Festival and Book Fair, which was postponed in April because of COVID-19. Therefore, we have included award-winning authors to present in mini writing workshops on poetry, fiction, memoir writing, and a children's half hour, all sprinkled among the Caribbean writer readings. My name is Alcest Lewis Brown, and I am the editor of the Caribbean Writer and also program chair of the VI Lit Fest. This event would not have been possible without core team members, such as Charlene Spencer Johnson, administrative specialist at the Caribbean Writer, Matthias Clavier, assistant director of communication, technology, and distance learning in UVI School of Agriculture, and Adrian Wajasa, working from Minnesota, who's our, what, our technology consultant. Diane Levan from the College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences, who's also a VIA Lit Fest executive, and Yvette McMahon, McMahon, who is also a VIA Lit Fest executive. And we, wanted, we want to mention some stalwarts who are always working with us, and VIA Lit Fest President Simon Jones Hendrickson. He has sent a video, and we're really happy to welcome him. Ellie Hirsch from the Children's Museum of St. Croix. Biko McMillan, Elaine Jacobs, Carol Henneman on St. Thomas. We also want to take a moment to acknowledge the sponsors for today's events. They include the St. Croix Foundation, Virgin Islands Lottery, VI Department of Tourism, and the St. Croix Avis. Let me take this opportunity to congratulate, acknowledge, and welcome our board members, our editorial board members, those who sat on volume 34 in the refereed process include Dr. Patricia Hawkins Pierre, who is an English professor at the University of the Virgin Islands. She's a long standing member of the editorial board. She's a poet and author as well. Dr. Vincent Cooper, also a prof an English professor at the University of the Virgin Islands. He is also a long-standing member of the Caribbean Writer Editorial Board and has now been advanced to the Editorial Advisory Board. And Dr. Lamarche Rupnarine, who is an author and professor at Jackson State University in Mississippi. And joining us for Volume 35 that we're currently reading for is Dr. Valerie Combi, who is a professor and author at the University of the Virgin Islands, and John Robert Lee, who's an author, poet, and radio commentator in St. Lucia. And I'd like to add that he has, he is known for knitting the Caribbean literati together in a, in, a, in a very productive and creative sharing space. And so I would like to welcome these members and congratulate them for the work that they're doing for the Caribbean Writer and the work that they have done for the Caribbean Writer in publishing volume and helping us to publish volume 34 in a timely fashion, notwithstanding the issues we've been facing with the, um, the global pandemic. protocol has already been established and so we would like to welcome you once again to this webinar and we're ready to begin. Hello, I'm Camille McHale, Provost and Vice President of the University of the Virgin Islands and I want to welcome you not just on behalf of myself but also on behalf of President Hall who was unable to bring you remarks today. Welcome to the Caribbean Writers event. Diasporic Rhythms, Interrogating the Past, Reimagining the Future. As I reflect on this year's theme in the midst of the double pandemic that we are facing, COVID-19, and pulling the mask off the racism that has so shaped the black and brown experiences in this country, there are many thoughts that occur to me. First, that your theme is timely. Interrogating the past, this is reflected in our questioning of those symbols of our nation. 
we celebrate that which we admire. Thus, what do our symbols tell us about our nation and what we admire? How can we understand today's issues if we do not admit that we could not be here without the past? If we are unable to understand the past, then we will not be able to chart our future, a future that is based on honesty and mutual respect. And what future can we imagine? When we question what if, then we in fact reimagine the future. What if? Our times also dictate, dictate that we leave our imaginations open for the unimaginable. Who would have thought that we would be doing everything virtual in 2020? We have to imagine, reimagine, and be willing to let go of any assumptions that we have. And so I want to congratulate the Caribbean writer and commend Alsace Lewis Brown for reimagining 2020 for being open to new things and for honoring the past. I am pleased to see so many returning authors who will remind us of Litfest's past while bridging the path to Litfest's of the future. I'm delighted to see the speaker lineup and know that attendees are in for a treat. Diasporic rhythms, be fed, be challenged, be soothed. I hope that these rhythms provide what you are needing at this time. I wish you the very best for this webinar. Enjoy. Well, thank you, Dr. McHale. And now we'll have Dr. Simon Jones Hendrickson, who has sent us brief greetings for today. Greetings and salutations to those of you on this virtual broadcast of the USVA Literary Festival and Book Fair. I'm almost able to be with you today physically because of a stroke I suffered four years ago and because of COVID-19. But the festival has been going on via the capable hands of Alsace Lewis Brown, Diane Gray Levons, and a group of friends and colleagues which make up the team. I want to thank you for being here and let us keep forward, moving forward. I want to say something from a philosophy to which I now subscribe. It is Sukhagaka International Nation Daishonian Buddhism. I now subscribe to that philosophy. Daisaku Ikeda, one of the presidents, said that even in times of hardship, we should always remember that we are the star, the hero, and protagonist of our lives and keep moving forward to surmount any obstacle with which we are confronted. He also notes that patience is in and of itself a challenge, but it also is the key to enabling us to surmount every obstacle. I wish you all the best as a gather on this virtual broadcast. I want to thank ISIS, Diane and the team in a very profound way for all the work they've done over the years while I was unable to attend physically. Please enjoy yourself here in the Virgin Islands and let us keep in touch virtually or otherwise. Blessing to you, Simon. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to um, connect with Dr. Jones Hendrickson. And now we, we always celebrate the covers. Our covers are always uh, submitted by a regional artist. And um, volume 34 is a work of art by Elisa McKay. And she is on, She's, we're gonna pull up the cover and 
Ms. McKay will um, tell us a little bit about the inspiration for the cover. And then after that, we'll go right into the presentation by um, Tiffany and, um, and Richard, and they will be introduced by Anna Portnoy, a poet out of Puerto Rico. Lisa? Okay, so um, I'm not sure that Elisa is in, um, but this is the cover for volume 34. And Elisa has a very um, interesting style where she uses fabric. Um, this is fabric on a, on a, on a photograph um, of a, a historic church in Christiansted St. Croix. And um, this is just one of the many arts of works of art that she has created over the years. And I thought that um, we'd like to give local artists an opportunity and a regional artists. Uh, we've had a variety of um, artists who have submitted their covers to the Caribbean writer. And we usually use a process of um, selection to identify one that would actually match our theme. And because the church is so heavily embedded in what we, and Caribbean dignity, power, and place um, in so many ways, we thought that this particular piece would be quite appropriate. She, she tells me that this is where her parents were married um, more than 60 or 70, 60 years ago. And so it's a very special place for her. And um, when she comes in again later on, I hope she, she arrives, we'll, you, you can meet her briefly, but let's move on to the next. Um, so we'll begin now with um, the workshop, the 20 minute workshop that is slated for um, presentation now with Tiffany Yannick, our Virgin Islands um, international author and poet, and Richard Georges, who's also um, an award-winning poet, and Anna Portnoy out of Puerto Rico, who will moderate the session. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Thank you, Alphys. Tiffany at the beach. <laughs> I'm just trying to pretend like I'm home because I want to be home. Hello. Hey, Anna. Hi, everybody. Hi, Richard. Hi, Tiffany. Nice to see everybody. Sorry, sorry, folks. There's a little bit of a reunion going on. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I will begin then. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, my name is Anna Portnoy I am a poet, writer, and organizer from Puerto Rico, and I'm speaking to you from the archipelago, too. Um, this segment is a poetry workshop with the award-winning participants Tiffany Yannick and Richard Georges. Um, the first presenter will be Tiffany Yannick. She is a poet, novelist, and short story writer currently teaching at Emory College of Arts and Sciences. And her last book, Wife, won the 2016 Bocas Prize in Caribbean Poetry and the United Kingdom's 2016 Forward Felix Venus Prize for a first collection. Um, and she will be reading for five minutes today. So please, a round of applause for Tiffany Yannick. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Alsa. Such a pleasure to be joining everyone out from all over the world in this way. Um, I'm just going to read two poems and then pass it over to my interlocutor, Richard. Um, and then we'll discuss our process and Anna will ask us questions and we hear from you guys also. I'm gonna be reading from Wife. Um, and the first poem I'm going to read is called African Animal. African Animal. The tradition is that as the sun grows older, he is driven out. He keeps to the corners of the community, but the women refuse him, their shelter or care. He does not understand what mama understands that he will turn bull will attack the babies and justify it he is just a child himself now he trails the women longing for them until one morning they are simply not there and he searches perhaps they are hiding perhaps they are dead but no they are only just gone from him this dismissal is the solution or it is the sickness. He eats alone, he builds himself a home, he waits for the women to come with great 
hope, he waits. When one arrives, he welcomes her with dance, a meal, but she wants a new home, one for lovemaking. He builds it for her. He uses his imagination. He spends his worth. He honors her, but she finds the place unsatisfactory. He builds another and another until she relents, accepts. When she is with child, he becomes nostalgic for his own childhood. He remembers his mother and his sisters. Of course, his bride does not stay. He yearns for a boy child who will want him, but he never knows. When his lover returns, he is too grateful to ask, too grateful to note that she has the mark of many births on her body, the mark of other bulls. He will never become accustomed to her leaving. He would challenge other outcast sons in hopes that she hears of his valor, loves him. In battle, there is a recognition among the bulls. Is this his son now grown and come to challenge him? Is this his brother? And the next poem I'm going to read is called Dangerous Things. It's the first poem in the collection. Um, Dangerous Things. This is the island. It is small and vulnerable. It is a woman calling. You love her until you are part of her and then just like that, you make her less than she was before. The space that you take up is a space where she cannot exist. It is something in her history that does it. Don't mind her name. The island is a woman. Therefore, dangerous things live below, beautiful things also, which can be the most dangerous. True, we will never be beyond our histories, and so I am the island, and so this is a warning. Thank you. Thank you for that stunning reading, Tiffany. Um, the next and final presenter is Richard Georges, the author of essays, fiction, and three collections of poetry. And his last book, Epifanea, won the OCM Bocas Prize for Caribbean Literature. And he will also be reading um, for five minutes now. Welcome, Richard. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'll jump straight into it. Um, this poem is from Epifanea, it's entitled, the year has become more beautiful. There is no power in the walls. The noisy nights rattle on. So I fill my cup with as much ice as it can carry and flood it with as much drink as it will hold. Green vines cover everything that was ruined. The rabble rousers light fires on foundations. They drink they smoke, they laugh loudly. There is more here than joy. Every morning I walk past a fallen tree, its broken boughs wet and flowering purple. This is a different kind of broken now. I've begun to learn that devastated does not mean dead, that ruin can be resplendent, that what has been emptied can be filled. This year has become more beautiful for the scars. I've heard folk measure pain by hurricane. You can still look through some windows and see only sky. Still see gaping homes like cupped hands. The day is full of heat. The screaming behemoths clear the rubble. Your morning walk is barricaded by afternoon. The map shifts. I know there are no such things as endings or beginnings, no cycles to measure, no useful predictions. The prophets are all mealy-mouthed and impotent. There is only this ball madly spiraling through space, and that is the most reassuring thing. 
From the windows of our bedroom, I used to watch our neighbors, their busy lives, the tempests. Tonight, our view is clear out to the channel, the moon making the waves sparkle silver. I'll read this one more, if I can find it. Here we go. <laughs> this one is called Rituals. Come, daughter, we must go now to the hill where our ancestors strode amongst the tall grass and worked and worked and worked until the sun still sets its burning light. It will still open eyes tomorrow. It will still pass. Come, Father, we must go down the hill where your blessed ancestors are still buried in this earth where each stone is cast and worked and worked and worked until this earth can stop spinning or my eyes fill with salt or as long as this day can last. Come, mother, we must go down the hill where the water is beyond the distant sail to hear these voices, the ancestors' final gasp who worked and worked and worked until the sun sank like a hurled stone and still we are here we are still here holding fast come children we must go now to the hill and work and work and work until thank you thank you for that powerful reading richard was that a villanelle um, I can't remember. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, Richard, Tiffany, how do you both feel about answering a few questions? Sure, let's go for it. Yeah, we would love to. Okay, lovely. Okay. Um, so I have a potential first question, unless, um, and then we can maybe let the audience ask one if that's possible. Um, as writers of the Virgin Islands, both of you um, from the British and the US Virgin Islands, currently inhabiting Differing spatial realities, Georges resides in the islands and Yannick in the diaspora or stateside. How do you feel your geographic positionality influences or affects the way you write about place and home? Um, and how do you feel your approaches relate or differ? Who goes first? <laughs> <laughs> Up to you. <laughs> Tiff? I'll go, I'll go, I'll go. <laughs> Since you call me Tiff. You endear me. <laughs> you endear yeah. yourself to me. Um, so I love um, that Richard and I are, are interlocking in this way. And I'm so glad that Anna asked that question and centered us both as Virgin Islanders. Um, often those divisions are problematic. And I like the idea of Richard and I being Virgin Islands poets, um, both. Um, so thank you for, for doing it that way. Um, for me, you know, I grew up in St. Thomas, born and raised but I've been in the States most of my adult life now at this point. Um, and my professional life has been up here. So I, when I write, um, I, and I always write about home and I always will, for me, it comes from a place of longing. I mean, I, it's, there's a definite sense of longing that I have for home, um, which tends to cause me to write things that are um, both historical in nature because I'm, I'm, I'm grappling with my own memory and, and maybe you know community memory of the Virgin Islands, but also tends to make me write things that are kind of speculative, where I am wondering about our potential futures. So I write in this forum called Magical Realism, mostly when I write fiction. And I think that has to do with the fact that I'm not physically at home all the time, um, which is like, I'm imagining home, longing for it, but also trying to be speculative and predictive. So I think that's part of it. The other thing is that Although I'm, I, I live, like I pay my taxes up here in the States, I, I haven't written anything yet that I didn't first draft when I was physically at home. So the other thing is like, I always draft at home. I revise up here. That's part of my process, it seems to be. But I usually am literally sitting on Megan's Bay when I first am crafting the, the first draft of most of my things. 
And I think that's an important thing for me to be physically surrounded by the sounds of home, the smells of home to begin the process. And then I continue the, the revision and the, um, the research when I am back in Yankee Landia. And there's a lot of overlaps for me. Um, it's, it's almost a, the origin is almost like a mirror because I, I come from an ancestral Virgin Islands family. Um, however, my father was living in Trinidad when I was born. So this generation of Georges were kind of like, we were all born in Trinidad and then, you know, made our way back home, if, if, if you could call it, oh, the, the ancestral home, if you could call it that, um, in, the, in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and I would say, you know, it's possibly similar impacts, but uh, for me, that Tiffany described, but they're based in me being physically here. You know, I'm very immersed in and invested in landscape and seascape and, and, and the flora and fauna, the smells, the warmth, the people. It, that, that's where I draw my inspiration from. So I think all of my books so far um, have been obsessed, you know, I, I think um, the first one was very explicitly obsessed with, with histories and, and narratives and how they intersected with the sea. Um, but the second one was much more focused on just the landscape, you know, and, and, and the, the natural world of the Virgin Islands and how, 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 how special a, a, a space it is um, for me. Um, my mom was uh, the deputy director of national parks for a long time. You know, so she dragged me out and my siblings out all over the place, you know, on coral reefs and we did dives and go on islands. So like all of that is, is always swirling around in me. Um, and, and that's where I see it as, as a font of, of inspiration. Like, like I'm always centering myself here. You know, so even when, um, you know, and it, so the inverse is that while I, my early childhood was in Trinidad, and I spent a lot of time in the States and the UK studying, um, my professional life has always been in Tortola because I've been affiliated, affiliated, I'm actually in my office right now, I've been affiliated with this school for the past, this is my 20th year at the community college in Tortola. So um, I'm very much rooted in, 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 in very similar ways that Tiffany describes. And I think um, while I, I might uh, envision things while I'm traveling, it's always when I'm here centered is when I'm, I feel like I'm most productive. The things I write when I'm when I'm abroad are very esoteric and kind of very hard to like to form into things. I might have images or, or phrases, but it's very hard to make something that is that is complete when I'm not centered. I, maybe for for longevity, we have to work on that, Tiffany. <laughs> or not? Just be home a lot. That sounds good too. Yeah. <laughs> I think yeah, that's where I'm at with with with, with uh, that question, Anna. Thank you. No, those were super insightful answers and super braided and interconnected with each other, especially with the mobility of both of your realities too. You know, you're constantly navigating and in motion. I actually have two questions. Now they're both specific to each person. So I have one Tiffany specific question and I have one Richard specific question. And I'll ask Yannick the first one, but I'll also read yours so that you can think on it a little Richard while Yannick is answering or, or vice versa. You can both decide who answers first. But Yannick, you're also a fiction writer. Um, do you feel cross-genre influences in your work or how does writing fiction aid or shed new like, uh, light on your poetic practice or vice versa? And Richard, um, who do you find yourself reading and or returning to during this um, pandemic reality and this moment of very urgent uh, political upheaval around the world? No? I'm really excited to hear Richard's answer to your question in part because of the poems that you read, Richard, they felt, I know they've written before this foolishness we find ourselves in now, but, um, and yet so perfect for our time at this moment. So I'm, I really want to hear your answer. Um, my um, response to the question about being a multi-genre writer um, is pretty banal in that um, the idea that writers should be like, you should be poet or you should be fiction writer, you should be playwright, you should be essayist. Um, that is a, a American, like uh, and European um, creation the, that silos writers. And I mean, African writers, Caribbean writers, Asian writers have never been a part of that nonsense where you have to. You are a poet. You cannot ever write a story. You are a fiction writer. You cannot ever write an essay. That's 
we don't know about that, right? So we have always been, and Walcott may be one of our, you know, very famous examples, multi-genre, like you were a writer, that's what you are. Um, and these are just different modes of accessing um, the material and the emotional impact that you want to access and that you want to have effects on. So I say that to say that, like, I, um, I have to often, like, um, uh, defend that in the States. And I find that I never really have to defend it at home. Um, nobody, everybody ex expects you to be right in everything. <laughs> um, because I think we understand ourselves as Virgin Islanders, but also as Caribbean people to be multiple. Like, I mean, what is more multiple than a Caribbean body, right? We are multiracial, we are multi-ethnic, we are um, like, even to say what is a Virgin Islander, you're from St. Thomas, you're from Tatola. I mean, we are just so multiple that it seems very logical that you would be cross genre. Um, for me, the way that it works most in, as far as process is that my fiction is, I, I hope, is very focused on um, language. And I pay as much attention to like where the comma goes in a story and like the, how my paragraphs are constructed um, in my fiction as I do when I'm writing a sonnet, right? It's as important to me that my paragraphs hold together with a kind of poetic beauty as it is if I'm writing a villanelle, right? It's important, it's, so for me, I write fiction with the, um, I hope, with the presence of language's power as I learned in my training as a poet. So that is how I think it, they move in between each other. And as a poet, I think my training as a fiction writer has made me attentive to voice in mm. the poetic world so that I think about persona, when I write poems, I think about who the speaker is. I think some of us, when we write poetry, we, the speaker is always us. But when I write poetry, the speaker is very rarely me because I'm thinking of a character um, who writes that poem and who speaks that poem. And I think that comes from the training as a fiction writer. So those different kinds of training influence the, the different kinds of um, writing. So I would say maybe I'm a rather poetic fiction writer, which is my goal, and I'm maybe, um, a rather um, character-driven poet. Richard, I'll let you get to the question and then we have two questions in the Q&A as well from audience members. Okay. Um, I really like Tiffany's response because I think um, I've, you know, I've been writing essays more so with the poetry, but I've really recently started to refocus on fiction. So a lot of my reading has been, um, as I'm both, I'm stumbling through the beginnings of a novel the past two years and then uh, Tiffany and I'm also stumbling through some some short stories, but um, which serves a welcome distraction from writing a novel. He ain't stumbling, but, you know. Just for the record, <laughs> he's moving, he's dancing. He ain't stumbling, but anyhow. In the dark, though, dancing in the dark, though. <laughs> um, uh, with respect to uh, that, that kind of influences a lot of my reading um, recently. So it's a quite heavily fiction, um, short, mostly a lot of short stories, and um, some some novels um so re i mean over over the course of the past several months i've like um read a lot of murakami um in terms of short very you know tight short stories um and because i also have that that, that, that uh the speculative bend to what i write in, in terms of, of of the imagination of of not just um possible or potentialities but also um um alternative realities that we have lived you know and, and, and um you know di different you know not not all histories are the ones that have been written down kind, kind of kind of um thing um and that, that, that's not speaking uh generationally i mean you know all lived histories or lived memories are, are very uh fluid right um aside from that aside from the murakami um victor laval's novel the changeling um I really, really loved that. Um, I remember the first Laval book that I, I really, that really got me into him was um, The Big Machine. So it's always like that kind of fantastical, is everything's kind of like normal and there's something that's just kind of like not at all uh, normal. So that's the kind of fiction I'm kind of been reading. Uh, Karen Russell's last collection, Orange World. And then there's a, I'm not sure where she's from. There's a Claire Beams has a, another collection called uh, uh, We Show What We Have Learned. So like, but, in, but there's something I'm reading right now that is not necessarily magic realism at all, but it's uh, Caroline McKenzie's uh, new book. 
um, the year of ugly. And that is, uh, I'm, I'm really enjoying the voice that, that, that she ha has created. So she's a Trinidadian writer writing about a, a Venezuelan family who have illegally immigrated to Trinidad and, and found themselves indebted to a, a Trini gangster, basically, um, named Ugly. <laughs> and it is uh, as, as hilarious and as um, absorbing and as addictive as, as that sounds. So that, that idea of voice and rhythm uh, on the page is something that I'm, all, I'm playing with right now. That I'm, I'm reading, um, so both the fantastical, the weird, as well as that kind of um, energy is what I'm, I'm really um, invested in because uh, we, we spend a lot of time very stationary <laughs> through this pandemic. So anything that, that, is, that has some kind of movement to it, it, it is definitely a, attractive to me. Um, and I, I'm, so besides that, I'm sure I'm missing some other stuff. I think Andrea Lee, lots and lots of short stories, basically. Lots and lots and lots of short stories. I think and then they're, they're, they're easy to read. You can finish a story before um, you, well, before nap time is over. You can finish a story, you know. So <laughs> those of us who are caring with for kids at home during the pandemic, uh, that's also key. Yeah, novels are a bit more difficult to get to. Sorry, Anna. Absolutely, no novels are a, are a longer time commitment. Mm -hmm. um, I think we may have time for one more question, and the first question that came in from the audience, I believe, is from. Carol, and the question is for Tiffany. It reads, Tiff, the sun is he and the island is she. Is this a statement of male domination? Mm. Um, no, although I don't see that question in the Q&A, but I love this question. <laughs> I love a feminist question. Um, the, the island I'm talking about, maybe that's obvious, is St. Thomas. Um, that's my birth island. My ancestral home is both St. Thomas and Tatola. Um, and so I'm, I'm interested in how things are named in the Virgin Islands because we have these incredible, you know, in St. Croix, you have like things named Hope. Um, St. Thomas, you have things named Fancy, things named My Folly. And I'm really interested in that and what these things mean. And I've always been curious about Thomas as the name of St. Thomas. And is it Doubting Thomas? Which Thomas it is in the Bible? Which saint? Um, so I was really obsessed with that for a while. And then it dawned on me that, that the name St. Thomas was obviously a name that comes from, you know, the colonizer. So was that even our name, you know, when we um, were first populated by our Aboriginal humans? I mean, I started thinking, like, when I think of St. Thomas, I think of it as a woman, as like, as a, as a female generative presence. Um, and so I decided to write this poem with that in mind, that the island itself is dangerous and causes danger. Um, St. Thomas, as you know, has an incredibly deep harbor um, that can be very dangerous. Um, and I wanted to think that through as a metaphor for the depths of female power, um, even as the island being an island is also vulnerable, which is also true. We know about women's bodies and how vulnerable our bodies can sometimes be. So I, I was thinking that through um, in that poem. The, the poem, um, uh, African Animal, where, the, where there's the bull and he's a he, um, is not so much even a poem about male and female relations, but in my mind anyway, and I think readers' interpretations are as valid as mine. Um, I don't think mine is any more valid because I write it. I think the reader offers um, at least 50% of the interpretation. But for me, when I wrote that poem, I'm thinking about Black masculinity not against femininity, but just what it means to be a black male in our culture right now. Um, and the kind of isolation that comes with being a black male, the way that black men have to constantly think about their bodies as being put, like sources of strength, sometimes violence, of sources of sexual virility, which also is sometimes violent. Um, and that black men are carrying that around um, but that like all human beings, black men also want to nurture and want to love and yet are constantly um, being told that that is not their place in our culture. And I, so that poem is me trying to think through um, what it might mean to be, you know, uh, an African animal, a black man and thinking through um, your desire to be connected and that desire constantly being thwarted by the expectations of masculinity. So the poems are not in, um, in contrast to each, they're, they're not against each other. They are in some ways, each one a meditation on femininity and one a meditation on masculinity. 
Thank you, Tiffany. Um, Charlene Alsas, I just wanted to check in on time. How are we doing? Do we have time for one last question from the audience or should we start wrapping it up? Uh, I think you should. Um, one more question. It has to be very short, Ms. Pants, and then after that's, that's it, then we'll wrap it up. We're moving a little okay. over time, but we'll try to catch up a little later on. And Mr. Douglas okay. is here with us, so at least we know he's standing by for his um, segment. Okay, I see that the next question in the Q&A is by, oh, Des, uh, Desi Resi Baran. It says, um, if the connection to ancestral is the connection to ancestral memory in your work organic, or is it something that you consciously work at? And I believe it's for Richard. Short answer, both. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think it, it is a preoccupation of mine. Is uh, um, you know, I, I, I often write about, um, you know, that there's a lot of un, unknowable histories, um, like beneath the surface. You know, so uh, I think um, I think it's ruins of a great house um, talks about a, a spade below um, the earth. You know, there, there there's this uh, ancestral um, pain, this loss, this blood, this evil that that is that is, this crime that has taken place, and that there is this uh, need for us to to, to really, um, for me at least, not if not to interrogate the history, because that's that's part of what we're all doing but to amplify for me the quieter narratives, the ones that kind of get left by the wayside, the ones that aren't from the big island, that aren't from the mainland, the kind, kind of kinds that don't really get the, um, you know, the spotlight. So there, there's lots of these really um, interesting uh, smaller events, you know, uh, like failed insurrections, um, you know, like, uh, small marches in, 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 the, in the 40s for freedom. There are all of these nuanced steps towards a liberation that get ignored for the, for the big, um, um, whether it was the independence or, 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 or the big bloody revolution. So, you know, but there are all of these smaller, you know, events that, 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 that deserve their, um, you know, their invocation as well. So I think, I think that's where I come. So I was saying it's, it's, it's a compulsion for me overall with everything that I write, but also there, there's a lot of uh, deliberate practice, you know, looking at, at, at what records are available, doing research and whatnot, and then trying to marry those two impulses in whichever form is appropriate. Danique, would you like to, uh, Tiffany, would you like to also um, address that question? Um, I, I would only say that I completely agree with, uh, with Richard. I think that, um, Anything that you want to do in your work has to be both organic and it has to be also, you know, labor. Um, so for me, I also am invested in ancestral memory. I write a lot about history and about um, our collective memory as a culture. Um, but that material has to be true to me. And sometimes that truth means that I had to cultivate it over time. Um, like you can adopt a truth and cultivate it. Um, but then it has to actually be organic and true to you before you go and write about it. I mean, when I tell my, my students who often want to write about race and, yeah, you know, I have my, my white students who want to write about blackness and I say, well, where's that impulse coming from? You know, what's, why is that? Where is that inside of you? How can that be, um, how can you make that an impulse that is organic to you? Maybe that means you have to write about your own white positioning before you even attempt to write about how to save black people, right? Um, so for me, there is a way to make these things part of your organic self, but they have to be part of your organic self. Otherwise, they're going to come out stilted and fake, and a reader will catch that, smell that, and close the book, um, and will feel betrayed by you. So for me, you know, it has to be organic. At the same time, you have to continue to work on these things. I don't, I mean, I think of myself as a feminist writer, as a Caribbean writer, as a Black writer, and I need to keep attending to my feminism and my Blackness and my Caribbeanness if I'm going to continue to write from those thematic spaces. So it's, it's both, yeah, it's both. Wonderful, thank you both so much for these amazing readings, for your super insightful responses. Um, thank you for your participation and for audience members for being here. Um, I think we'll pass it back on to Elsas. Thank you very much, um, Anna, for being a, such a great interlocutor and Richard and Tiffany, as usual, I'm always so uh, inspired by your work. And um, I'm so happy that you're part of the Caribbean writing, Virgin Islands writing community and that, we, that I always reach for and reach to and you always 
respond so graciously to us and we feel very blessed to have you among us. So Richard, have a wonderful graduation ceremony. Tiffany, give your children my regards if you have to leave. But if you don't, please stick around and you and Anna can stick around and, um, and enjoy some more. But we have coming up, Mr. Paul Keynes Douglas, an extraordinary Caribbean poet, literati, social commentator. He has been around for many, many years. And yesterday, one of our um, authors, um, Tobias Buckle, who's, who's a New York Times bestselling author as well, Tiffany, said that he was an inspiration, that Paul Keynes was an inspiration for him as he grew up and up both in St. Thomas to become a, a writer. So Mr. Douglas, without further ado, we will welcome you. Um, Adrian? And Mr. Douglas will, will be around for five to six minutes afterwards to take questions. Good afternoon, folks. First of all, let me see how nice it is to be part of the Caribbean Writer online launch of its 34th volume. And I must say special congratulations to all of you, and thank you for inviting me to share with you. You know, I always like to begin by addressing you as family. Because any time we come together like this to share, to celebrate, to enjoy, or even just to get to know each other better, we become more than just writers and poets, invited guests and viewers. We become family, Caribbean family. So let's share it for family. Then we must also remember to pay respect to the ancestors, those who have been long since gone, but who are an integral part of the very culture that we celebrate at events like these. So let's remember the ancestors. And then in true storytelling tradition, it is important that we clear ourselves of all responsibility for the things that may go wrong, things that we have no control over, like COVID-19 and the new normal. That's why storytellers like to let you know it's only a story they're telling, so you don't hold anything against them. So they say, once upon a time, it's story time. In the French islands, in Lucia, Dominica, they say, Tim Tim, story time. Jamaicans say, Jack Mandora, me not choose none, story time. Spaniards say, Abia una vez, story time. Trini say, quick crap, monkey break it back, story time. Journalists say, reliable sources, story time. Politicians say, if elected, you know it's story time. And of course, nowadays we say fake news. Anytime you hear that, you know it is story time. You know, they say you can't tell where you're going until you understand where you came from. That's why your theme, interrogating our past, reimagining our future, is so significant. Because it shows that you understand the importance of learning from the past that you recognize that all the success we enjoy today didn't happen by accident, but was built on the hard work and dedication of many who went before, who overcame the hardships and challenges of their own individual journeys. And that is as true today as it was those many years ago. Each of us is on his own individual journey, writing his own individual story. But this journey can be much more productive and much more rewarding if you are willing to listen and learn from the past so that we can inform and reimagine the future. They say a wise man learns from his mistakes and a wiser man learns from the mistakes of others. To me, writing is self-expression, self-preservation, guided by the creative imagination. And therefore, you can only truly write what you feel. Sometimes four lines can be as magnificent as an epic poem written with bells and whistles and all the trapping of literature. So don't limit yourself by comparing yourself to others. That is a recipe for unhappiness trying to be somebody else or trying to write like someone else. Just be yourself, be natural, let it flow. Just take out the cork and pour. You'll be surprised at what comes out. Today, I was thinking of poetry and writing and what it has meant to me over the years. At school, I was never very good at the science subjects. I loved to read and I loved to write. So I excelled at all the written subjects, especially English. I when I say English, I mean standard English, no dialect or West Indian authors. Not that they didn't exist. They just weren't a part of my curriculum. I mean, I love the drama in Shakespeare and I can recall poems like The Daffodils by William Wordsworth and The Solitude of Alexander Selkirk by William Cowper about a fellow maroon on an island somewhere and which they say was the basis for the story of Robinson Crusoe. It somehow caught my imagination. And the one about the boy stood on the burning deck whence all but he had fled, the flames that lit the battle wreck shone ronging o'er the dead by Felicia Dorothea. You know, uh, these are some of the things I remember when I look back. And they could have been part of the catalyst for my desire to write. I mean, who knows? Or for my love for dramatic effect, who knows? But they were part of the journey. 
Then, then one day I started to write poetry and stories. I wasn't motivated by any great writer or book or whatever. I just had the urge to put things down on paper and I did so. I can't remember the exact day I became a writer. Of course, you never call yourself a writer. You just write and feel good about it. It's up to other people to call you a writer. Then you can always say, well, if the whole world says I'm a writer, then who am I to disagree with them? But a poem is a poem is a poem is you. I learned a long time ago that if you want to write your poem a certain way, that is your business. Or if you want to be a certain kind of poet, then that's your business. You don't have to be a great poet or know all about poetry and literature and be able to quote from the giants or try to sound as if you know. You just have to do what comes naturally to you and feel why you're doing it. Some of us have a natural knowledge. We don't have a clue of why we know. We just know what we know. We just know. Brothers and sisters, these have been just some random thoughts and insights as I interrogate the past, as I reflect on the individual journey that has brought me to where I am, to who I am and what I am. Poet, writer, social commentator, storyteller. The truth is that no two journeys are exactly the same. But it's nice to know that you're not the only one out there searching for a way. And I think the best way to sum it all up right now is to tell you one of my favorite stories. A story that is a product of all the things I have spoken of today. The story of the pan. It's called Pan Ram. Once long ago, not so long ago, and the story I am telling is true. A man take a pan and with a hammer in his hand, cool so, he invented something new. It was an ordinary drum in which the oil used to come. It didn't make no particular sound. One note, maybe two. You could beat it till you blew. That was all it could do for you. Then this man get the pan with a hammer in his hand and he say, you know, I think I understand. If the drum making one and the drum making two, hey, well then the drum could well make quite a few. So the man take the pan with the hammer in his hand and he took down the on the ground. And he hit it and he beat it and he stretch it and he mark it and the pan start to make a new sound. Ting, 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 Hey, was a do way me and a me way do was all he could make it play. But the song so sweet, he take it in the street, was the first time they hear pan play. And all the way he go home and the crowds get wrong and they jump to the nose of the pong. And none would forget how they dance and they fed on the day that the steel band was born. And since that time all over the land you could hear the sweet sound of pan. For they hit it and they beat it and they stretch it and they mark it like the man with the hammer in his hand. They make a tenor pan and they make a second pan. Then they come and make a double tenor too. Then they make a guitar pan and they make a cello pan. So it takes 100 men to make a band. They playing do with me and fast all that you do, any place the pan can go. Upper class, middle class, lower class, new class, classics to Kaiso. It was born on the streets of Trinidad. It has now gone far and wide. And there ain't no stopping, and there ain't no staying. It's the sound of a people's pride. So when you hear the beat of that steel man in the street and the shuffle of a thousand feet, remember that man with that hammer in his hand, who put the first notes on a pan. How he hit it, and he beat it, and he stretched it, and he marked it, as he stooped down day on the ground. How he hit it, and he beat it, and he stretched it, and he marked it, and the pan started to make that new sound. Ting, 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 ting. And that's how the steel band was born. And on that note, I think it's time to enjoy the rest of the launch. Congratulations again to the Caribbean writer on his 34th volume. All the best to you. Quick crack, story done, and remember, stay safe. Good afternoon. Now we can, we're going to entertain questions from Mr. Paul Keynes Douglas. If there are um, members of the audience who would like to ask a question, you can 
put it in the chat and um, or I think in, on his screen, the question should also come up, but I'm gonna ask Yvette and Charlene to um, work with me here on navigating this, um, this part of the questioning for Mr. Paul Keynes Douglas. Just monitoring the chat. I think we have lots of comments. Um, wonderful, awesome, bravo. Uh, we invite questions at this time. Wonderful stuff. I have a question. Go ahead. I want, I, I would like to ask um, Mr. Parkins, what the stopper in the bottle represents for him when he says, you know, you open the stopper and then you just let it flow out. What are the stoppers in the bottle? Well, yes, we, well, oh, <laughs> that's the question. Well, hi, here I am, right? Well, yes. stop all the things that keep you back from doing what you want to do. You know, the complain to other people, the fear to do things, the, the desire that you want to and yet you're not sure, you know, uh, would it be good, would people like it, would they not like it? So many things stop us from just relaxing and doing what we want to do. Sometimes people bring stuff for me to quit, critique, for instance, and sometimes I can't critique it because they say this is, this is what I want. And so most you can do is polish it for them because if that's what they want, this is what they want, you know, and this is what, how it should be. We can try to change them. So there's so many things that stop us from just being ourselves. I mean, we, we, and I'm going back years now, when I started writing, um, you know, you, you always thought the poem had to be structured and, you know, for it to be true literature, you had to all have what these literary devices and so on. But when you're just a normal writer, you just write, you know, you don't know about literature, you just have the desire to put on paper. And then you, so when you try to be like the English, the poets, what's called traditional literature, you feel you must, you can't sing a song, you can't do it this way because that's not literature. And the moment you free yourself up from that, it's like a revelation. You begin to say, well, it's my poem. If I want to sing one verse and dance the other verse, I can do it because I am setting the rules now for my poem. And you remove all those stops. And once you remove those stops, you begin to just, it's free because you become, well, the pioneer in a sense that you are going to do your poem the way you want to do it. And no, if all the universities say this is what the poem is, or that's their business, you're writing it the way you want to write it. And when you remove those shackles, it's amazing. You just free yourself up and it begins to flow, you know? Because what I thought was a poem before I started to do poetry, you know, it was confining me to being like, as I said, the Shakespeare and the Woolworths and all the poetry we got in school growing up. And it wasn't like I could put a calypso verse in, in the poem or could sing one part of the poem, I can write prose in the other part. I can do what I want, it's my creativity. And the moment you move that, you were free, right? So in the end, you became your own, your own critic and to me, my audience became my critic. I was not writing for the university to say it was good. I was not writing for the literary people to say it was good. I was writing that if my audience said it was good, then it was good because I'm writing for them. And that freed me up, you know, and, um, and I, I just continued writing and creating and putting new stuff in. And of course, if you're not into literature at the beginning, you're doing things that is already done in literature, you don't know. There's no, you just don't have a, 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 a terminology for it, but you're doing it automatically, you're doing it by natural instinct. Um, and you're learning the job, so to speak. Because I didn't study literature at school as such, I went to do literature. I mean, I did it as, as um, you know, as part of my training, uh, university, all of us did language literature and so on. But I didn't study literature, you know, and I started writing. To discover a long time afterwards, I was doing all the things they were teaching me in school anyway, but I was just doing it naturally, you know. So, so I freed myself up by just saying, okay, I'm going to write for my audience, and that was it. So I know that a lot of people who want to write and they feel they have to do it a certain way for it to be accepted. Of course, today, I'm talking about way back then, eh? because when I started, um, you had stuff like I was writing in dialect, and that was sort of a big challenge, the dialect versus the standard English. So I always had to fight to preserve dialect. This is what I want to write in, and say, no, 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 you have, you have to write in standard English. Of course, that's one of the arguments going back years, but now dialect is native language, it's all different things to do. But in those days, you were already struggling to preserve your dialect as a, a professional, official language in poetry and so on. So there's so many things that stop you from going forward. And once you move that stop, I'd say your poem flows. Are there any other questions? Um, Yvette? Um, 
Yes, this is Charlene. Um, there are a number of responses. I was mesmerized by mesmerized by the reading and the story. Fantastic. Thanks for imparting all this wisdom about writing. Um, I absolutely love your approach. It makes me feel better about my writing. These are some of the responses to your presentation, sir. Um, I'd like to say that I heard you first. I think it's, I was about eight or nine years old with your Tanti Merle story on her pink parasol, which I have never forgotten. Um, and it's just exciting to, to hear you all over again. It's really great. I have a question for you. Um, in your words, you said you were not a doctor or a lawyer or a carpenter, but you are an awesome storyteller. And so um, my question is, what would you say is the some message, that overarching moral of the story, of the storytelling that you've done over the years? Is, is there such a thing? Well, the, the main thing of it is that um, you're trying to capture, you're trying to record, you're trying to be historic. You know, people ask me where do stories come from? Well, they come from all around you. You, you, you. you know, you go to a funeral to get a good story for a wedding. You know, you go to a wedding, get a good story for a funeral. It just depends on how you view life, how you see what you see, you know? And in trying to record, you also become a historian because remember poems and the story written at a certain time records what's the events of those days. And then um, in the dialect, writing in the dialect, you had no real guide as how to write. You had to sit down and make up your words yourselves in those days. We're talking about going back how many years. So we could, dialect was not a written thing. You had Louis Bennett and several people pushing the, pushing the flag, right? But so when you decided to write in dialect, I started, I wanted to write in dialect because really and truly I was, I was up to that point standard English. When I, and I got influenced by Louis Bennett of Jamaica and I began as well, I could write in dialect too. But remember, you have nobody to follow. So you're going to write um, your own dialect. You have to spell the words the way you feel the song. So you spell D-E. D, D, them, they, all you, all of you, all are we, right? You're trying to put a sound on the page because you want the poem to sound as real as possible to somebody listening to it. And therefore, you try to capture the sound on the page by spelling the words as close to as possible to how you hear them, how you want them to sound. And you become a dialect writer, but then you become the pioneer. People follow you and they say, well, oh, well, I will spell it different. It was me, well, that's your problem. You go ahead and spell it the way you want to, say, to spell it. But that's how the language develops. So you write it down and um, you, you, it, it's exciting because you become the person person creating the stuff. Others come behind you and they change and so on. But um, once, as I say, you free yourself and you want to write it. You, 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 you become the person to, to do it because there's nobody else to say you're patterning yourself after, you know, um, especially, of, of course, and then we didn't have exposure to a lot of West Indian writers who wrote in dialect and American writers. We didn't know them. We were just, as I say, to uh, young people who want to write, you know, and we want to write in dialect. So we're going to write what we hear and what we song. And you start to become a pioneer. Today, uh, there's a different language out there, the computer language, you have uh, all different things. So that today's young people writing would have to include that in their poetry. They are recording today, you know. But the certain principles remain the same. You have to have good memory. You have to have pronunciation. You have to have diction, right? You have to be able to see what you're writing. You have to be able to see who is seeing you. When you're writing, you ask, who am I writing for? When I write, I see the audience. I see people responding. I see them answering to the joke. Sometimes I laugh at my own joke. I find it funny in my own head, right? Sometimes I wonder why people laugh. But the point is that you are creating your stuff on, 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 on the spot. You know, you're doing it yourself. So a lot of it has to do with um, your, the way you are and the time you are, right? Um, so today is so ex exciting. I remember today you have all the heads of computers and you can go to and Google, you can do all kinds of things. My day, we had to go in the library and look up everything. We had to do our own research. You got to go to find it. It was, it was hard work, you know? But, then, but then, then this is what you want to do. Because I say to be a good storyteller, you have to like what you're doing. That's the first criteria. And you have to like what you're doing. You want to do it. If you're dead, you say, I want to dead telling stories. I like it so much, right? Because this is what you want to do. Then you have to have command of your language. Your voice is your instrument. Look at my voice. I, I'm speaking like this for the last so many hundred years. And my voice is still to me as same as, as it has always been. Because you take care of your voice. Your voice is your instrument. Like the guitarist has a guitar and the saxophonist has a saxophone. You have your voice. Then you have to have your, your diction, your pronunciation, your, you know, because what you write in a poem, people can't understand you waste of time. So you have to learn about diction and voice. People say, Paul, what's the biggest problem you have in the Caribbean? I say, boy, 
think of it, communication, accents. You have Grenadian, Vincentian, Dominican, Trinidadian, St. Tomian, Crucian. You have all kind of accents. So understand the problem you have in even people understanding our poetry. For instance, Grenadians say prefer. Vincentian say prefer. I mean prefer, 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 prefer a Trinidadian passing. So Trinidad, tell us, man, what is the word prefer? Or prefer, you say, boy, personally, I prefer prefer, you see? So, <laughs> you understand, the, the accent, I mean, you think of, say, why we can't be understood ourselves over the years. It's because sometimes we have not been speaking properly to each other, right? Same thing goes, same with either and either. You know, Vincent say either, solutions say either, arguing, either, 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 either. A Barbadian passing. You know, Bajans feel that they talk the best, so they have the best um, accent in the whole world. Bajans never lose the accent, you know. All other West Indian people lose the accent, not Bajans. So arguing either, 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 either. A Barbadian passing, I say, boys, tell us, man, what is the word either? Or either, hey, big man, either, man, either, 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 either. <laughs> so, that's why when we talk about the language, we have, you know, communication is key to the story, storytelling. Then you have to know your audience, know who you're telling the story to, right? Pick the right story. Sometimes it's not that you, you're wrong or you're not right. You're just telling the wrong story for the audience. Okay, great. Uh, what, let me interrupt you right there. Now that you mentioned your audience, there's a, there's a question here that says, um, there, it's from Timothy Hodge. He says he's been following you for 45 years and he's been privileged to see you perform. Would you say that the audience expects different from you nowadays? How, is, is it a new audience? Are their expectations different? No I, no, I don't think so. The audience expect to hear what you want to tell them, right? Then, and then if you tell it right, they, they will enjoy it. So it's a story, it's a story, it's a story. The young people may expect, but of course you have to reflect what your society is about you also. So if you're telling today's stories, you must reflect the, 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 what's happening around you. And this is where the story comes from, the events. You have fun, you have riots, you have all sorts of things today that we didn't have when I was writing. So you, if I write today or when I write today, if you have a lot of these new things, these new words, new imagery coming into it. But the principles remain the same. If you as a writer um, are trying to preserve, remember, your dialect or your culture, then it's your duty. Other the writers can write about all different things. That's why we have different writers. You have to decide what is your mission. If your mission is say, I want to preserve folklore, then I'll focus on the things that concern folklore in today's society. So it, it, it doesn't matter. But what, you have to, what matters is that you must be a good storyteller, that you must be able to convey your message to, to, to them, to whoever is listening, right? Because you go to the audience, they don't know what to expect really until you begin to speak, right? Then you either pick it, um, they either understand you or they like it or they don't like it. And if you want to make a point, then you just package your materials so it can, that can relate to your audience. Many times when I travel and I have to do foreign audiences, I have to take the same time to maybe adjust the story to suit the foreign audience, right? You don't change things, just find ways of telling them the story. Maybe you explain before you do the story, this is what it means, and then you do the story. Or sometimes you write the explanation inside the story. So while you're telling the story, you're describing what it is. So any foreign audience would understand. So no matter what poetry you do, when you go, you always have to adjust your audience. You can't be sort of, you know, arrogant and say, well, that's them. If you want them to understand, you got to talk to them. And therefore, you have to come down to their level and adjust, you adjust your presentation. Not change what you want to see, but adjust your presentation to them so that they understand it. I guess any performer has to do with musicians, everything the same thing, understanding your audience and relating to them. Okay, um, we're going to allow one more question and then we'll turn it back over. And this question relates to storytelling. Is there a place today for some of the more traditional stories, the Anansi tales, the supernatural characters and so on? What do you think? Well, there is, uh, there is a place, because, but you just have to say want to do it. That's why I said just now you have to decide what it is you want to do. If you want to concentrate on folklore and preserve the folklore, you take that as your mission, and this is what you write about. You are a storyteller who deals with this kind of thing, right? I dealt in early years a lot of folk, because my early upbringing was folk tales, so my early work had a lot of folk tales and stuff. And now I do a lot of social commentary again, this way it's a package. Yes. You have spoke words and your sort of thing. But the, the people have the talent, but you have to want to do it. And I think this is where the schools come into to place, where they can teach children and expose them to stuff that they can write about, you see? And part of our tradition, I say, as a storyteller, I'm trying to preserve. So I'm trying to preserve the folklore and the folk cultures. So I always include folk tales and folk stories in any performance I have so that they live on. Because the only stories only live when you tell them. You don't tell them they die or they just stay by the wayside. But there is a place there. What has happened is we have lost a lot of our good storytellers to music. 
because music attracts a crowd, right? And they go where the crowd is and you, you can gather people with a crowd. The point is they become Calypsonians, they become artists, they become all different things. They don't become traditional storytellers where your voice is your instrument, where the magic is your voice. You don't need the prop. You don't need all these things. Your voice is supposed to create all the imagery with just the voice. This, I always say when Karen gone, other people can't perform. Because without Karen, they can't do nothing. But the true storyteller, if his voice, Karen could go, it doesn't matter to him. He can step there and deliver. He can make you hear the music. He can make you see the words. That is the true storyteller. He, he speaks through his words. And therefore, there's always a place for the storyteller. But the modern society, we have lost them. They're still storytelling. They're doing it in music now. They're doing it in rap. So they're doing it in spoken word. And then every now and then, you, every now and then you find one who will come out who will be doing the traditional thing because that's what he wants to do. But there's all the, the, the dynamics are there for the, the culture to, to proceed. It is just that we, we need to encourage people into these stories. And our problem is they don't get exposure on the media, they don't get exposure on the air. The children don't hear them, and this is why. Without exposure, all these things just fall by the wayside. But then each generation has to take its responsibility for what they want to do. In my case, I did mine in the folklore, and it has brought me to where I am now. And the next generation will do the same. But, um, but the principles still remain the same. What do you want to write about, you know? And um, I'm always going to be the folk. Thank you so much, Paul Keynes Douglas. Um, those of us who grew up with you um, are just ecstatic to just hear you. It's like being at one of your performances, listening to one of your performances. This was mesmerizing, to quote someone who's texting me as we listen to this uh, from different places. But thank you so much. I want to turn it back over to Alces. Um, you have been an awesome presenter for us this Sunday afternoon. Thank you so much. I see Charlene clap, clapping in this. Thank screen. you so much. Let's thank you so same. much for that, thank you. Mr. Douglas. We really appreciate that. Now, our next, next up is a, a set of readings from, the, from volume 34 of the Caribbean Writer. We have um, the section being led by Laurie watts Hirons, And then after that, and she's going to read, and then Z. Stanley Nematelli. And then the next reader will be um, uh, Shani Isaac and Bindu Maharaj. And Nicholas Drayton is um, also here, should also be here with us. If he's not, he will be in part of the lineup there. So if we could just kind of go, if you heard your name, um, we want to go, if you get five minutes, but because we're running behind, try to be very judicious about your use of that time. And perhaps if you keep it to maybe four minutes, that would be very nice. But if not, we'll understand. Thank you, Alsace. I'm, I'm assuming since I, you named me first, you'd like me to go first. Yes. Okay. Um, I do want to make a comment about the last presenter. One of the things as a writer I've always been told, especially as a poet, is that we are storytellers at our core. And it's what makes us write more than anything else is that need to tell a story. And that's always been my ambition. I think it's always a lofty goal that we shoot for every time we write something. And uh, that's certainly what I try and do with my poetry. So my poems are typically fairly brief. They're not the longer ones that I think get into the, the Caribbean writer. Um, but I'll read this one. And the, just a little background on this one as well. It's fairly timely because as we've seen, at least on St. Croix, sort of the influx of so many p visitors to our island as we're trying to figure out what our COVID behavior is supposed to be. I know there are times when we're in public and we see people who aren't, um, who are visiting us and some of the things they do, I think we tend to sometimes kind of roll our eyes and think, <laughs> you know, are they putting me at risk? Or do they realize that, you know, this is our home and we want to be safe? Um, but it's always uh, sort of the, from the viewpoint of kind of watching, watching and seeing what's going on and, and trying to take all of that in. So this was written um, uh, really last summer and it was um, actually about a, a real individual. He was a, a gentleman who had been a uh, bartender on a number of establishments on the island, uh, passed away unfortunately last year, but it was at his uh, memorial where people were telling stories that this, this story kind of came into my head. So that's the background. There is no answer, the old man said as he shook his head and spit chew through the gap in his teeth. His hands were gnarled and spotted and nicked from years of opening Crucian rum and Grey Goose and PBR. 
He looked at me through roomy eyes that once held a special shade of blue. Everyone thinks bartenders know the mysteries of life and how to bet on a Patriots game. I don't know either one of them, either one of those things. More of a declaration than an answer. You gonna order something, he, he demanded. I looked around at the half empty bar of chatty tourists and happy hour workers and yardmen speaking patois on this marble of a rock crashed in the Caribbean Sea, miles and miles from anywhere, and shook my head. I swatted the mosquito buzzing my head and drummed my fingers on his bar. Did you want me to read the other one too, Alces, or just that one? Oh, that would be fine. That's that's fine. Okay. Thank you so much. Charlene, thank you for the clapping. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right. Um, next up with the with the Stanley Niamatali. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm Stanley Niamatali. I'm from Guyana. And I thank you and humbly acknowledge the honor to voice my vision on this platform of esteemed writers. Thank you. Um, the first poem I'm going to read is called The Fishmonger, which was published in volume 25. The Fishmonger. <clears throat> in the Brown province, in the Brown province, under a relentless sun, she comes walking past the sleeping dog, bamboo basket bobbling on her head. Mothers and daughters pour from their homes to witness her catch. Her fingers curl around the braided brim and gold bangles clink on her sweat smooth arms as she lowers her creaking burden. She unrolls a coil rag revealing dark, shiny fish and green lily pads. Hearing her price like ripples, the women recede. Smooth as a card shark, she stacks the fish on the lily leaves. The women meld in agreement. Emboldened with her acceptance, they erupt with snudge. Next time, we won't buy as they give her money, moist from their breasts. On bended knees, the women gather fish at her feet. A glow, she parts, her bamboo crown ablaze with blinding light. The second poem is in the volume 34, and I think I ask Aless to um, post the photograph. And um, it's this photograph I saw um, in 1992, but the haunting image never left me. And the poem I wrote is based on this photograph. Uh, in 1992, Somalia faced um, famine, and you know I don't know how many people died. Okay, redundancy of fate. Blissfully, she will suckle her angel who blessed her womb after a night of holy pleasure. And after her husband's riddled body convulse, she will hope for rain on the land he plowed and planted. But the rain, the rain will not come. She will pound moldy millet and dry dung for meal. But the rain, the rain will not come and guilty memories of her full stomach will torment her in sacred mockery. War, war will come and wetted with blood, the leached land unslaked will hunger for the marrow from fleshless jointed bones in the drawn paltry sacks. And from the deep mirror of eternal suffering, she, another mother, heart cleaving with the force of her world eclipsing in her powerless class, will journey this listless and timeless path across the impressed, unimpressed sand to the end of her bitter time and lay her soul's sacrifice for the altar beyond the sun. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, and then there's Bindu Maharaj. Hi. Good afternoon. Lovely being here. Has been really lovely so far. Um, so I'm Bindu Maharaj and I'm from Trinidad. Um, new to the whole writing process and all of that. I'm going to read for you this afternoon short story that was published. Um, it's called Birthright. And what I did with Birthright is I tried to find a point of intersection for the, our ancestry or history with a con within a contemporary space. Because despite knowing of history and knowing, you know, your origins and so on, I live now. So to, for something to feel organic, um, I had to create or situate the story in the present time. So that's what I did with the story. And it's a folklore story. So I hope you all, you know, enjoy it. So it's called Birth, right? The fire had awakened, flickering through her veins as it stretched and quivered, growing while it scratched its way to her flesh, and scorching through the stretch she skin that chained and twisted and pulled and simmered, thinning and thinning until it was a translucent film of brown. Through it, bloody shape red, red foraged, biting and gnawing. It shrieked, thirsty to escape, but it couldn't. Its captor wasn't ready. Then, just as suddenly as it had awoken, the fire stuttered. Its tongues straining into the surface until finally, defeated, it sank into the river of ember, into a calm warmness as it retreated into the redness of her veins. Then, in a slow crawl, her skin relaxed, creeping back to her flesh until it was a blanched brown membrane that sheathed her body once again. Evangelique's eyes opened with the same calm of a fading dream. Her body was covered in sweat, with her cotton tees and loose long pants clinging, clinging to her silk skin. Groaning, she twisted sideways to find the phone on the bedside table as her muscles stretched. The screen lit up as she held it and showed that once more it was 11 o'clock. And again, she had awoken drenched with that familiar feeling of ague as if her insides had been on fire. Is this madness? But at this age? Sitting up in her bed, she grabbed the AC remote and turned down the temperature to the coldest it could be, and then lay back on her pillow to touch her arms and face. They were so cold and clammy. But why am I feeling so hot? What the hell is happening to me? With an arm across her chest, and her fingers grasping at the stickiness of her neck over and over again, Evangelique fell asleep to the lingering sound of her skin peeling away from her probing fingers and the receding thoughts of a fiery dream. Is that enough? Or should I continue? Thank you, thank you, thank you for that. Thank you, thank you very much. So we've been long awaiting the next segment, and um, I'm going to turn it over now to um, Ellie Hirsch. Hey, Ellie, you're on. Good afternoon. I hope we have some children and families who are clicking in. I know it's a little earlier than anticipated, but I hope you're here with us today. And um, I'd like to um, welcome Winnie Oyoko Loving, who will be sharing one of her stories with us. She's a, a retired teacher uh, in St. Croix, and she's also the president of the Children's Museum of St. Croix. Um, we very much appreciate being part of the activities of the um, Caribbean Writer Literary Festival. Um, last year was our first year participating and we had a tent and this is a new way to participate and I hope that there's children and families watching. So I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Oyoko and please um, moms and dads, if you have your children on, put it on speaker view so that you'll be able to see the pictures and, and the storyteller. And without further ado, Oyoko, it's all yours. Hello boys and girls. My name is Winifred Oyoko Loving, and I will read a story I wrote entitled, My Name is Freedom, illustrated by Ivan Butcher. 
My name is Freedom. Freedom is a little girl with big bright eyes, a shy smile, lovely thick hair, and runner's legs. Hello there. My name is Freedom. I live on a very pretty island in the middle of the Caribbean Sea. The name of my island is St. Croix. My mother and father wanted me to have a very special name because I am their first child. They always tell me about how long they waited for me to come into their lives. I am special because they love me. In East Africa, where my great, great, great grandparents came from, the word for freedom is Yuhuru. You can call me freedom or you can call me Yuhuru because they mean the same thing. Whenever I write my name down, I feel so good. I'm proud of myself because my name is something I think we all need. When we have freedom, we can do many things. We can own our own land, grow food in our gardens, make our own clothes, and sing our own songs. I usually spend the weekends at my grandmother's house by the bay. That is freedom for me. My grandma teaches me how to cook, plant seeds, and sew on her old machine. Sometimes she takes me fishing or for long walks along the water. We talk and I tell her, Grandma, the neighborhood kids laugh at my name. And Grandma smiles and says, don't worry, you'll be okay. After church on Sundays, we visit friends or play at the beach. You would love the food we serve at beach parties. Everyone cooks. Someone will bring a huge pot of seasoned rice. Somebody else will prepare stewed chicken and potato stuffing. My mother is the queen of Kalaloo. Yes. At school, my teacher shows us how to do research on her laptop. She's my favorite. I have two younger sisters. Would you like to meet them? This is unity. Unity means togetherness. Sometimes when daddy says, clean your room girls, we all do it together and it comes out better and much quicker too. There's a whole bunch of things to do together. Unity is mostly a happy child, but every now and then she says, even though I like my name, the kids at school tease me about it. Mom says, don't worry, you'll be okay. This is justice. She's the baby in our family for now, but soon she won't be the youngest much longer. Can you guess why? Justice is kind of hard to explain. Daddy says it means doing what's right. Like fixing cousin Lakota's toys after you break them or saying you're sorry when you push Cheyenne down and really meaning it. Our mom says, Save some cake for your father. I guess there's some justice to that. Sometimes little justice complains. I wish I had a different name. My friends laugh at me. I don't like my name. Dad hugs her and says, don't worry, sweetie. You'll be okay. Now you've met my family. All of our names stand for something. Your name has a meaning too. Maybe you are named after a grandparent or a town or a star. Perhaps your name was created from letters that sounded nice when put together. Are you a Jaja? 
a Jamila or a Jazzy J, a Karisha, Katani, Kenoya, Kamau or Kimba. What about Kike? Don't forget Injuri, Jumani, Jedaya or Jaquan. Those are all beautiful names and your name is beautiful too. What is important to remember is that things like freedom, family, togetherness, and doing what is right can create happiness in our hearts. Pretty soon my mom is going to have another baby. Daddy says he has a feeling it's a boy. That means we'll have a baby brother to love and hug. Can you help us think of a name for him? The end. And thank you, Yoko. I know she's not on that it was not live, but I've heard her tell the story before. And I love it because it also sort of fits in with uh, teaching our children virtues and teaching our children um, to be proud of themselves and proud of their, their families and their ancestors. So next we have another storyteller from the Virgin Islands um, and who is a teacher in the Virgin Islands and also she's a fellow Vir uh, Virtues Project facilitator. So I didn't realize that that's who we were having on. So I'd really like to introduce Charlene Abramson who will be t reading her story to us. Good afternoon. My name is Charlene Abramson Joseph, and I am the author of the Vienna Cake Mystery. And the illustrator is Danica Davy. There is a Vienna on the sill. Tra la 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 la. It's a pretty little thing. Tra la 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 la. Now dash back, dash back, dash back to see the fancy cake. Long, long ago, under the bright St. Croix sun, Tilda Turtle carefully added icing to her seven layer Vienna cake. She was proud of the beautiful layers of yellow cake filled with sweet guava berries, guava, hard pineapple, and spicy green lime jam. She gently set the cake on the kitchen window to cool and she began to clean the kitchen. An hour later, Tilda Turtle's neighbor, Bobo, saw the cake as he passed by. His eyes grew big and his mouth watered. What a delicious looking cake. Is it for a special occasion? Tilda Turtle nodded and smiled broadly. I have so many guava berries. I wanted to use them before they spoil. And with a sly smile, Grogo waved goodbye and he went on his way. Later on, Miss Hen sashayed by Tilda Turtle's window. She saw the cake and she thought, oh my, I would like to have a slice of that fancy cake. Not long after, Milton Mongoose scampered past Tilda Turtle's window when his nose sniffed a buttery aroma. Milton ran back and saw the glorious Vienna cake. Oh, how he longed to taste it. That afternoon, Milton Mongoose, Rogo, and Miss Hen met under the large shady mango tree. While they talked, the subject of Till the Turtle's cake came up. Miss Hen, did you see the Vienna cake sitting? In Miss Tilda's windowsill, Milton Mongoose asked, I want a piece of that cake, Rogo Joe. That cake reminds me of the cake my granny used to make, Miss Hen confided. I can't stop thinking about that cake, Milton confessed. And they all agreed they wanted a piece of the delicious looking Vienna cake. Rogo said goodbye to Miss Hen and Milton Mongoose. He walked towards Tilda Turtle's window for another look at the splendid Vienna cake. Suddenly, 
he glimpsed Tilda Turtle walking to the house. Feeling a little embarrassed, Rogo dashed behind a big bush. And then he ran back to the road. He didn't realize he had dropped his favorite red handkerchief. Milton Mongoose and Miss Hen left the mango tree on their way to the market. They talked about the delicious looking Vienna cake. And then Miss Hen said, Milton, you go ahead to the market. I have to make a stop. She waved goodbye and she hurried away. Tilda Turtle was about to check on the cake when she remembered she left her clothes drying on the clothes blind. So she went to the yard for her laundry. When she returned to the kitchen, the cake was gone. Well, my piece, where is my Vienna cake? Tilda cried. She ran to her neighbor. Somebody has done a terrible thing, screeched Tilda Turtle. She sat at Darty Tug's kitchen table and she began to cry. Oh, Tilda, I'm so sorry somebody stole your cake. I can't believe we have a thief among us. The next morning, Tilda Turtle awoke with a plan to catch a thief. She put all her energy into making the most magnificent Vienna cake anyone had ever seen. And then she added a secret ingredient. After the cake was baked and iced, Tilda put the cake on the windowsill for all the neighbors to see. One hour passed and the cake sat in the window undisturbed. Tilda decided to visit Darty Dove. Tilda, did you find out who stole your cake? No. I have no idea who stole the cake, but somebody in the yard must know. My mama used to say, time is longer than twine. Whatever you do in secret, it will come to life. Thank you for the cup of sweet bush tea. It was just what I needed. When Tilda Turtle returned to her kitchen, the cake sat royally in the window, its white icing glistening in the sunlight. She went to her garden to pick some herbs. And then she went to the chicken coop for eggs. And on the way back to the house, she noticed the cake had disappeared. A huge smile spread across her face. In no time, she heard bam, bam, bam. Someone was banging on the door. Water, water, please, water. Tilda opened the door. On her step stood Row goat, his red hot tongue hung out his mouth and his eyes grew big. Tilda hurried to the kitchen and brought a jug of water for Row goat to drink. And he drank and drank and drank. All the neighbors heard the noise and ran to, tur to Tilda Turtle's house to see what the commotion was. After Row goat's mouth cooled and his eyes stopped tearing, Tilda said, I put hot yellow pepper in the cake to catch a thief. And Robo, Robo, I caught you. I thought we were good neighbors and friends. If you wanted a piece of cake, all you had to do was ask. Robo hung his head in shame. Miss Tilda, I am so sorry for stealing from you, but the cakes look so sweet. I just had to have them. I will never do it again. Please forgive me. Then he walked slowly away as he left Tilda Turtle's house, passing all the neighbors gathered outside. The next morning, Tilda Turtle opened the kitchen door. The sun was shining on another glorious cruising morning. When she looked down, she saw a bag sitting on the step with a note on it, and it read, Dear Miss Tilda, our neighbors helped me make you another cake. Please accept the cake as my apology. Your neighbor, Rogo. Tilda placed the cake inside on the table and then she looked, took the note to show her friend Darty Dove. After reading the note, Darty said, Well, well, Rogo seemed very sorry. Miss Tilda, will you forgive him? Of course, I already have. Darty, I need you to do something for me. And Tilda whispered instruction in Darty Dove's ear. 
shaking her head, she listened and promised to help kill the turtle. Hours later, the neighbors, including Milton, Milton Mongoose, Rogo, and Miss Hen, gathered in Tilda Turtle's yard. They questioned each other about why they had been invited there. Tilda Turtle joined her guests in the yard and spoke. Dear neighbors, I want to thank you for helping Rogo bake another cake. Good neighbors look out for each other, and you helped him. Rogo, I forgive you, but tomorrow morning at six o'clock, come and cut all the grass in this yard. Rogo nodded his head and he smiled gratefully. And then till the turtle brought out the newly baked Vienna cake and cut a slice for each of our neighbors to enjoy. And the wheel bend and the story ends. The Vienna cake mystery. Thank you, Charlene. That was wonderful. Uh, a real message of restorative justice, right? Thank the, you. Yes. <laughs> as we as we bring it to a close, and I I really challenge um, families to work with their children when they read stories to think of ways that they could follow up with the stories and have discussions. Both of these we've had are wonderful ways for to talk about um, virtues, to talk about restorative justice, to talk about even bake. Maybe try to bake a cake yourself. And, and there's a recipe. And with a Yoko story to brainstorm names for the, for the next child. So uh, to get involved in conversation is really what it's all about, to help stimulate that in, in children as part of the storytelling. And both of those stories are really enjoyed. Um, our next, our next um, speaker is, actually, is from Atlanta, and she's a very renowned children's author, Deneen Milner. Last year, she spent time with us in, um, in our children's tent um, when we were our first year at the, at the literary festival, and which we enjoyed, this being our first year virtual. Um, but um, we're happy to have her back to share her stories and to share her thoughts about writing for children. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I am always super excited to talk about my passion, which is writing the written word, art, creativity, and storytelling for babies. Um, I, 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 I talked a little bit about this last year at the incredible, incredible event, and I'm super happy to be presenting again today about Deneen Milner Books and you know the impetus for, for starting it. Um, I had when I had my children, um, my first daughter was born in uh, 1999, the second one in 2002. And this was before Amazon, before you could go and just sort of go on your phone and order a book at your fingertips. This was, you had to go and get to the store. The store had to be bothered to actually um, carry black children's books. And you had to be there at just the right time to snatch up the one or two copies that they had. Um, and if you missed that, then you just didn't get those books. Um, you know, very rarely were they reviewed, very rarely did they receive good marketing and promotion. And it was just by word of mouth that you understood when a new um, Black children's book was being published. And to this day, those numbers are still pretty paltry, right? Like um, just a couple of weeks ago, the um, Lee and Lowe books, which actually calculates how many of the children's books actually include stories um, about Black children and families or written or illustrated by, um, you know, people of color or, you know, specifically Black folks. Um, the numbers are still only about 9% of the books are actually written by or illustrated, not both, by Black people and only about uh, a, a little over 200 out of 3,500 were um, about Black children and families. And so the, um, the publishing industry is, is just really not doing its job to um, achieve parity when it comes to storytelling about Black children and families or creating space for Black storytellers and Black illustrators. And so here comes Deneen Milner Books, um, which is my imprint that I just moved over from Agate Publishing to Simon & Schuster. Um, 
you know, I went over to Simon & Schuster last year um, from a smaller publishing house, specifically because I wanted to have access to the resources of a large publishing uh, company that would be able to put money behind paying Black creatives for their work, which I didn't have access, very much access to at the old, smaller, independent publisher, um, and to put the marketing and promotion and you know decades of experience behind actually selling these books and getting booksellers to sell the books um, getting uh, uh, you know getting the author to be able to go out and do what we're doing today like present the books to people the librarians to teachers to schools at book festivals and things of that nature something that I didn't have access to at Agate but have access to at Simon & Schuster. Um, but when I went to Simon & Schuster, I, and I, I had them, they needed to promise me that they understood my mission. And my mission, and I'll tell you that and then go ahead and read um, one of my favorite books that I published. Um, my mission was to create space solely for Black people, period, to tell Black stories period, and for Black artists to, to tell those stories in illustrations, period. And if they couldn't understand and accept that I only um, you know, publish Black creatives, then I couldn't work with them because I had that deal at Agate and I, and I needed that to continue at Simon & Schuster. Because when you look at the numbers um, for, the, for the books that are written that do um, feature uh, Black characters, they're usually written by white people or illustrated by white people or both um, and very rarely are they um, illustrated and written by black people and so what what i want to do is create the space for black folks to tell our stories and the second mission for Deneen milner books was to um to expose readers to and children, librarians, everybody who reads these books to the everyday humanity of Black children. And it's a shame that in 2020, we're still arguing that people should see the humanity of Black children, right? Like, it's ridiculous that I'm even, you know, sitting here on this day at this moment and saying, we need to understand the humanity of Black children. But here we are, right, with us having to say out loud and unapologetically that every book that features Black people does not need to be about slavery or the civil rights movement. That it doesn't have to be about a Black first. It doesn't have to be about Michael Jordan and Muhammad Ali every time. We don't need any more books about Harriet Tubman before we have books about children losing their first tooth and being afraid of the tooth fairy. Or before we have stories about little Black kids going to kindergarten for the first day and being scared and, and how they need to be hyped up and, you know, and understand that this is a good, that they're going to learn and it's going to be a good day. We don't need another book about Martin Luther King before we have another book, before we have a first book about a little boy going and getting his hair cut and feeling good about it. Like that, so that was, that's my mission. I'm not saying that there's no room for books about um, you know, first or the civil rights movement or slavery or history. Absolutely, we all need to know our history. Our children all need to be exposed to that. I trust that at some point parents are doing that and schools are doing that. They're not, <laughs> and I understand that. But as for me and my house, what I like to do is celebrate Black children and their everyday humanity. And so um, that's what I've been doing with, with Deneen Milner books. Um, one of the books that I want to present to you is a book that um, when this author took it to um, white authors at some of these publishing houses, they specifically you know, turned it down. He got turned down over and over again because they just couldn't see the story as something that was interesting or universal. I don't know what their 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 problem was or what it was that they were missing. But as soon as I read it, um, you know, on my computer, just you know, a, a simple form, a simple manuscript that was sent to me, I saw the magic in it and immediately told um, this author, Derek Barnes, that I wanted this book, and he agreed to let me publish it. 
and that book went on to, um, it came out in 2017. In 2018, it went on to win eight major awards, including the Kirkus Prize for Children's Literature, um, a Newbery Honor, a Caldecott Honor, and um, the Coretta Scott King Award um, for Literature, and a Coretta Scott King um, honor for illustration and the Society of Illustrators Award and a few other smaller awards. But the point being that people saw the magic in this book because A, it's a beautiful book. It's beautifully written. It's beautifully illustrated. The um, illustrator was a first time illustrator. I wanted to make sure that it was a black person. Maybe if I could open a door for somebody to um, be able to, if this is what they wanted to do, open the door and let you get the first shot and so that later on you have something to show for your work and you can get more work, then so be it. And this brother just killed the illustrations and won all of these awards for, for the beauty of this book. Um, and it's a simple book about the, the beauty of, of Black boys and how they feel when they get their hair cut. It's called Crown and Ode to the Fresh Cut by Derek Barnes and illustrated by uh, Gordon C. James. And um, I'll read it to you. So I'm not sure if you, will you be able to see the pictures? I guess, yeah, I'll make a point of holding up the pictures because you really should see the illustrations as I read them. But this is an example of um, the humanity of Black children, specifically back Black boys and our celebration of that. When it's your turn in the chair, you stand at attention and forget about who you were when you walked through that door. Look at his little face. He's so cute. You came as a lump. Can you see that? You came as a lump of clay, a blank canvas, a slab of marble. But when my man is done with you, he'll want to post you up in a museum. That's my word. He'll drape you like royalty with that cape to keep the fine hairs off of your neck and your princely robes. It's amazing what a tight fade, high-low ball does for your confidence, Dark Caesar. Who knows? You might just smash that geography exam tomorrow and rearrange the entire principal's honor roll. A fresh cut does something to your brain, right? It hooks up your intellectual. You're a star, a blazing, brilliant star. Not the kind that you'll find on a sidewalk in Hollywood. Nope, they're going to have, a, they're going to, have to wear shades when they look up to catch your shine. He'll lean you back in the chair, dab that cool shaving cream on your forehead, and then craft a flawless line with that razor. Slow, steady, surgical. It frames your swagger. The cute girl in the class across the way won't be able to keep her pretty eyes off you. Her friends will giggle and whisper, girl, he's so fine. Yeah, that's what they'll say. The whole school will be seasick from the rows and rows of ripples. You'll have more waves on your head than the Atlantic Ocean. Shout out to my do-rag and patience. There's a dude to the left of you with a faux hawk deep part skin fade. He looks presidential. Maybe he's the CEO of a tech company that manufactures cool. He's a boss. That's how important he looks. Due to the right of you looks majestic. There are thousands of black angels waiting to guide and protect him as soon as he steps a foot out that door. That's how important he looks. There's a dude standing in the mirror that can't get over the masterful designs crafted on the side of his dome. Everywhere he goes, people will ask for his autograph. 
He looks that fresh. He looks like he owns a few acres of land on Saturn. Maybe there's a river named after him on Mars. He looks that important. There are two dudes, one with locks, the other with cornrows, and a lady with the butterscotch complexion, and all they want is a shape up, tapered sides, a trim, and a crisp but subtle line. And sometimes in life, that's all you ever need, a crisp but subtle line. When your barber is done, you'll feel like a million dollars and some change. When his fingertips hit you with that apple green alcohol or that witch hazel, it'll sting, but not like a scorpion or a hornet, more like an electric stamp of approval. And when you see the cut yourself in that handheld mirror, you'll smile a really big smile. That's the you that you love the most. That's the you that wins everything. That's the gold medal you. Every person in the shop will rise to their feet and give you a round of applause for being so fly. Not really, but they'll look like they want to. You'll see it in their eyes. It's the look your English teacher gives you when she hands you your last test with a bright red 97 slapped on it. It's how your mother looks at you before she calls you beautiful. Flowers are beautiful. Sunrises are beautiful. Being viewed in your mother's eyes as someone that matters, now that's beautiful. And you'll take it. You don't mind at all. Finally, he'll remove your cape, then swipe you down with a brush made from a golden horsetail. You'll put the money in his hand without even expecting change back. Tip that man, tip that man. It was worth it. It always is. And you know why? Because you'll leave out the shop every single time feeling the exact same way. Magnificent, flawless, like royalty. Hello, world. And that's the end. Extraordinary. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you know, I remember my son when he was four years old and um, he was three and I gave him a cut that was a mama's cut and it wasn't very nice. <laughs> uh, next time I said, you know, I would take him to the barber and he was so petrified. He Aww. was held on to my skirt and, you know, and that book, I, for me as a young one, then that would have been so helpful. Right. For me to right. give to him when I put him on the, on the chair, but the barber was really nice. The barber was, hey, right. big man. He right. look so, so, and so, and so, and he said, yeah, you know, he gave him a little, you know, and then he sort of calmed down. But I do remember he was uh, almost five, and I had stopped the mama cuts because they weren't, <laughs> really got good at that, and he uh, was petrified. And he, I'll he, tell he, you, I read that book um, to everyone from kindergartners all the way up to 17 and 18-year-old boys. And the 17 and 18 year old boys giggle just as hard as the five year olds because they see themselves for the first time in a way that validates their everyday experience, the things that, um, that make them happy, right? The things that are so normal to them that are so normal that they don't realize that we don't recognize them as normal because nobody talks about them in the way that they're talked about in this book. And the way that Derek wrote in his, um, in his author's letter in the back, he said that there are three places where black boys feel loved and tended to and cared for unconditionally. 
that's in their in, in their homes with their in their mother and father's arms in church and in the barbershop and it never occurred to me that um you know that the barbershop could be counted in those three simple places specifically for black boys who you know still go out into the the you know out into the world and get treated like they're way older than they are or that they're a menace if they're too tall or or that they're about to do something bad if you know they they look older or whatever it is that people decide their stereotypes are in their mind that makes them treat them like they're pariahs when they go to a barbershop they sit in the chair and every man in the ha in, in in the barbershop is hey little man how you doing Oh, look at you with your hair cut. All right, now you looking slick, man. You look at, you know, that kind of thing. When they get out of the chair, they are being held by the community. They are being held by people who know exactly what it means to walk to the other side of that door, what they need to be filled with inside the barbershop before they walk to the other side of that door. And as a woman who does not have sons, I didn't necessarily know that. And so when this manuscript came across to me, I knew enough that, oh my gosh, you know, like little boys are going to just completely flip out over this. Mothers are going to be able to identify with it. Fathers are definitely going to be able to identify it. And you can use it as a tool to get your child ready for his first haircut or use it as a tool to just let little black boys know that we see you. You seen, we see you. And that's the point of Deneen Milner books, to let Black children know we see you and we see you exactly as you are in your, your whole human little self. And we love you and we appreciate you and we wrap you in love. Even when that's not done elsewhere, you can count on these books to do that for you. Um, Kelly, you wrap up? Well, <laughs> that, I, it was very powerful in many ways. And I have to say that I totally appreciate your mission and your enthusiasm and energy behind your mission. And um, I hope these books make it on all shelves all over the United States, in the Virgin Islands, but all over because as, as we work together, we all, all need to to be able to see the humanity in all children and, and especially black children who've been minimized. And so Absolutely. I have to hand it to you as um, I, can, I really appreciate your mission and I, I'm anxious to see more of those books because that <laughs> was fabulous. And, you, and the way you read it and showed the pic and the pictures are captivating. So thank you, thank, thank you very much for that. Thank you very much for that. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Um, Yvette, um, could you just yes. kind of share the experience we had when um, we went under her tent while she was here? I know you were really excited about that, and um, that was the highlight for you. So can you? Yes, <laughs> actually, yes, um, Denine. It was one of the highlights for me. Um, one, another was when you worked with the students at the Juanita Guardian School and um, early in the week. And I'm actually here um, sending text messages with a friend of mine who is in Texas, and she's sending me pictures of her sons looking at this presentation on her TV um, as it's going on. And I, I'm, I actually sent her some pictures of Denine's presentation under the tent. I went back to my phone and pulled out those um, pictures. And it was this same story, Denine, that you were reading to those kids under the tent. And I kept telling Alice weeks after the um, VIA Lit Fest wrapped up that this experience under the tent was the most Ex amazing experience for me. That's what stood out, <laughs> even with all the great presentations that we had for the entire four days of the Lit Fest, that experience under the tent stood out for me. And while we are not under a tent today, it's also the experience that stands out for me. As I listen to your passion, your purpose, and your mission. The only thing I'm sorry about is that it's not during school where we could have had a whole bunch of children on here so that they could hear you read this again. So I just want to thank you for that experience. Alsace, if you check your phone, you will see a number of pictures that I sent to you on WhatsApp. 
It's these two little, little boys in Texas looking at this sex section. So they are pictures of uh, Winnie reading and they're looking at her pictures of Deneen reading and pictures of Charlene reading and these little boys looking at it. And I want to thank yeah. mom Beautiful. for just bringing them to this session today. I'm excited also about uh, talking to my, my, uh, my neighbor who's 10 years old about this. I'm sure he's, he's looking on, but he's a little shy. I don't think he'll say anything, but I'm looking forward to Bilal um, telling me about this session afterwards. Um, are there any comments from Charlene and, um, and Elaine? I mean, I'm sorry, not Charlene. Charlene and Elaine, are there any? Before we move into the session, and Adrian, are there anything else that we need to be concerned about, Matthias? There are questions from the audience in the chat window. Yes. Okay. Can we take a few questions? Um, Elaine or Charlene, you can. Yeah, it says, where can we purchase those books? The illustrations are wonderful. Oh, so um, Crown is available wherever books are sold. You can go to, you know, independent booksellers, which I'm always a big fan of. If they don't have it on the shelves, then you, you know, ask them. They will happily order it for you. You can find it in the libraries. The libraries have been really, really good about supporting the books. If you, you know, can't, if you don't have access to um, a, an independent bookseller, or you know, don't, or you know, just don't have the money to buy it, you can go and read it in the library and share it, um, or you can go the super easy route, which is to go on Amazon or Barnes and Noble online and purchase it there as well. But I, I know that you can, there are a lot of book, independent booksellers that are, um, you know, because of the pandemic, they're able to, um, you know, ship the books to you just the same as, as any other bookseller. So, you know, I encourage you to go to your independent booksellers or your libraries and you can pick it up wherever those books are sold. And if you look for Deneen Milner books, there are five books out, I'm sorry, there are seven books out now, and there are two more coming um, before year's end. Um, one, so there's a, a book called My Rainy Day Rocket Ship about a little black boy who uses everyday household equipment to build himself a rocket. And there's another book called Just Like a Mama that is about a little girl being raised by a foster mom um, and just sort of the, the relationship that they have with one another. Um, and then coming out later is one called um, If Dominican Were a Color. And that's about um, a, a gentle story about colorism and the beauty of blackness in the Dominican Republic, which as I'm told is a little, you know, hairy, the way that, that folks look at color there. Um, and then there's another one called uh, Me and Mama about a little girl and her, and her um, walk in the rain with her mom. And all of them are just as beautiful as Crown. Just, you know, I've, I've been trying very hard to, again, create spaces for illustrators who, who have not had the chance or the ability to work for other companies. So I have a lot of new illustrators, um, some new writers, um, and great storytelling. So yes, you can buy all of these books wherever books are sold. Great, and, and again, just to repeat what you said, these kinds of stories are very, they're humanizing, they validate who you are. And that goes so long, such a long way into to, to framing the individual, right. into having them find their place in the Absolutely. society. Um, so now, uh, you know, based on that, I'm going to piggyback on to another uh, question that's asked. It's a little, um, it's a little affront in the question. Okay. Um, so, so, you know, hang on. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful book, but seeking some clarity. Are you saying that it's more important to teach the boys confidence in themselves than to teach them anger management? I'm not sure our issue in the Caribbean is the same as in the continental U.S. Hmm. Um, well, there, you know, I would never suggest that one takes the place of the other, right? It's all about raising confident, beautiful, intelligent, emotionally, um, you know, available and emotionally intelligent Black children. And so, you know, maybe a child would pick up Crown who, you know, is angry because you don't see him. And maybe he would pick up that book and it would be read to him with, with the love, care, and attention that he deserves. And maybe that anger might dissipate just for that moment. 
maybe you might be teaching that child that he's worthy of love. Maybe you might figure out why he's angry in the first place. If you're taking the time to sit down and share a book with him, share, which means you're sharing time, you're sharing a story, you're sharing creativity, you're sharing love, right? So I would never suggest that, that you should focus on anger management as opposed to showing a child love. I think that that, that all of that, every human being has that whole range of emotions that they have access to. And we as parents, educators, um, people who love children should have the capacity to employ our, um, our humanity, our parenting skills, our human skills, our grown up skills to teach a child how to manage those emotions. And they have the, the, the right to all of them. Yes. Thank you so very much. Well said. Um, thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. It's been an inspiring, inspiring presentation that you made. Thank you. It's absolutely um, my pleasure. Um, uh, there's um, there's a, an additional um, uh, note in the chat that says the Vienna Mystery can be purchased at Amazon locally and Synchro as well at Eden South and the Caribbean Museum. Um, maybe maybe um, we can also get those books at the Caribbean Museum and at Eden South and the other um, local bookstores, huh? Thank you. That would be lovely. <laughs> Thank you so much for all that you do, Miss um, Milner. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Brown? Thank, Thank you for having much. me. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'd like to just, um, before we get into the next session, which is moderated by um, Carol Henneman, we want to say to folks that volume 35 of the Caribbean Writer is the, the current uh, journal we are accepting submissions for. It's dedicated to Edward Kamau Brathwood, who is a, an extraordinary Caribbean giant who passed away, literary giant who passed away in April. Mm -hmm. And um, we also would, would like to um, invite you to purchase a copy of volume 34 of the Caribbean Writer at our website, www.thecaribbeanwriter.org. It's $20, the digital version. And you can also order the physical copy because there are those of us who just love to touch and smell and taste the book. And I'm sure Denine understands that. And so yes. I know we're always going to have those bibliophiles who want the physical copy of the book, but those who are more um, who are interested in getting a digital version, put it on your phone or whatever, you can purchase a copy of this volume and a few other of the earlier volumes at our website. And so before we get into the session, Adrian, could you play one more ad and then we'll move into Mrs. Henneman. Please be ready to stand by for your session. <laughs> The Avis salutes the 34th publication of the Caribbean Writer. Some 33 years ago, Professor Erica Smilowitz pitched the idea of the St. Croix Avis sponsoring the Canute A. Broadhurst Award for Short Story Writing. We thought it was an excellent idea at the time to foster and highlight fine literary works. Davis has happily done so ever since. We wish much continued success to editor Alsace Lewis Brown in publishing The Caribbean Writer. We are confident it will be yet another great literary keepsake. We send our hearty congratulations. Okay, the, the, um, the name of the artist, somebody just asked a question before we move in, Mrs. Eneman, please give me one second. The name of the artist for the, the cover of volume 34 is Elisa McKay. And um, I had her scheduled to appear second this earlier today, but she was unable to appear. But we did speak a bit about it and we even showed the cover. So that question, uh, and if Ms. McKay comes on before we sign off after five, we will uh, allow her an opportunity to speak about the uh, impetus for the cover and what inspired her to that, for that beautiful work. So I hope that answers the question. Mrs. Henneman, you're on. Good afternoon. Uh, Alces, I know how you are, but I'm very sorry you can't get away this afternoon. Oh. You, you normally try to keep your your profile very low, but I'm calling you out on the literary carpet now because I'm going to speak about 
your piece of volume called Questions Raised in the Virgin Islands Place, Space, excuse me. So I only think it's appropriate that I ask you the questions. And so you have to answer me, okay? And the first question to you is, you use this excellent definition of, of, of the belonger by Kenneth Ramshand, where he, 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 he subscribes to the whole idea that a person doesn't have to be born in a place to know, in quotation marks, the place. So I want you to tell us as a writer, where do you see as your space in the whole Virgin Islands place? Um, thank you, my friend, um, from kindergarten to now, who, to, for putting me on the spot like that. Um, in this Virgin Islands, I'm a Virgin Islander. Mm -hmm. I'm also an Antiguan. And just as I can't separate my tongue from my teeth and my right breast from my left breast, I am both those things, and I don't have to choose. So I know a lot of times people like to talk about this all this nationalistic stuff, and sometimes when I speak to that, it makes certain people uncomfortable who are sitting in that place where they hide their origins because of whatever the political um, needs are, or they may express their origins because it's, it, it's expedient. But um, I've always been taught as an Antiguan to love my roots and my heritage. And as I was been in the Virgin Islands since I was five years old, and uh, we've known each other from being in elementary school and, and, and being in Girl Scout and all that, Carol, all the way back to, I played in the dust, I climbed the trees. I am a Virgin Islander. I, I love Antigua. I am, I will not choose. And so that's what my question is, my answer is. Okay, the, <laughs> the, the essay is so poignant and so powerful and so full of historical, ramifications for all of us. But I want you to speak to the issue that you raised about the way the African woman, the black woman voice in quotation marks is represented in our history and our culture and our literature because you, you bring up this disturbing uh, context in which the slave owner is looking at the woman as she sleeps next to him and he rubs his hand against her scars and speaks to what it would have been had she been considered, what, human? And so I think of Zora Neale Hurston and what she said about black women that were the muse of society. And so I'm asking you now to juxtapose those two um, considerations as we discuss your work. Okay, I, I think that the essay you're referring to, I, I should have, um, I guess, um, friends sometimes don't alert you to things that will come. No. So I will rise to this occasion. But I think you're referring to an essay that I wrote as a response to uh, an essay that was written by a, a writer named um, Kai Miller in an in a online journal called Pre. And the journal, they refer to that essay as an incendiary essay by the award-winning Jamaican poet Kai Miller that probed at white women writers' authority to speak for the Caribbean. And it was pulled out of a, a, the magazine because it, took, it got so, many, so much flack. And uh, in fact, people, at that year, he was supposed to be at Boca Slit Fest. And um, there were people who, writers who pulled out of the festival because they were so insulted by, by his, um, his essay. And they, it's, the essay was entitled, The White Women and the Language of Bees. And um, in the question, uh, it's, it is, he asked, how many years and decades must pass before we can belong to a place and to its words? That was the question that the essay explored. And um, it, was, it came as a response to, um, a reading that took place last year. I, I wish, um, I don't know if Fartain Horger from Norway is here right now in the audience, but if he's here, I'd be happy to have him help me with this, um, this pressure I'm under. But um, <laughs> he, he read a piece from his book that was written in, 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 in Norwegian. And, um, and the character 
who was a slave owner, um, he shared how the slave owner got into the bed and ran her arm over this, what ran his arm over this scar and watched how the woman undressed and, and how he, he was wondering what kind of animal he was to be do, have, making love like this. And in another time, maybe this kind of touch that he gave the woman would have been considered a caress. And I had driven, um, driven him to the, um, to the university. We had, I introduced him as one of our speakers. And I was, you know how sometimes you, people say things and it, because you've been trained as a, as a professional to have, to, to convey civility and professionalism, there is a, there, it kind of, your stomach kind of gets knotted and you, you breathe hard because something hits you, but you can't show it. You have to maintain that professional patina. And I saw some of the women in the class kind of take a deep breath. And so after about 30 seconds, one of the students said, so was that person a racist? And he said, um, yes, that person was a racist and that is exactly how a racist would have thought. Mm -hmm. And then they started to ask him a number of other questions. And I said to myself, as a, as a, as a instructor, um, you know, you can't shy away from the tough things, but it was an opportunity mm -hmm. to, to explore. You know, when you go into a cistern and you get to the bottom of the cistern after the water is done, you see all the sludge and sometimes you might see frogs and centipede in there. And even though you've been getting clean water coming out of the tap, and you, but if you don't clean that cistern and dredge it out, you never really get, you know, the true bottom of it. And so I went to the bottom and came to the top and I really like uh, Mr. Horger. In fact, he and I have, um, we communicate a lot because he's very frank, very straightforward. He gave us a perspective that sometimes we, we shy away from those things, yes. shy away from people that speak about those things. And I know I have a lot of white friends that I know they like me, I like them. And I, and I think that conversations like these, I try never to shy away from. I try to keep it real with them because they are, I don't see um, their color in the way, um, the, in the way that it's, it's an aggressive kind of thing. I see it, but I'm a person, they're a person and that's never an issue. But this conversation kind of um, got us to that place. And this is how you have to question, like Dr. McHale said in her opening yesterday, you have to question and if you question, that's when we get to the place where we can heal. And so I thank you, Mrs. Henneman, for putting me in a spot like that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about it later. But the reason I ask those questions is that it's so important for us as a people to understand that we have to be active participants in our own definition. A lot of times we simply accept whatever people call us to be and we don't explore what we really are, and we don't present a voice that allows for this kind of exploration. And sometimes you have to confront the people with whom you have amiable relationships, but they also, I have a dear friend, God rest him in his grave, who said to me one night after I made an, a, 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 a presentation at the library in St. Thomas, the Enid Bar Library, he said to me, you know, Carol, I, I don't know how you're going to take it, but I'm going to say it. I he said, if it weren't for slavery, you would not have been in the Caribbean. And I looked at him and I said, you are not from the Caribbean and you are standing in my library and you didn't come at the bottom of a slave ship. Yeah. And that was the end of that discussion. He never said it to me again but he understood what I was telling him. Yeah. Why should I be happy that I came on the bottom of the screen? Still, still my friend. Okay. So he, can we get to the um, piece, please? Yes, we can time, get to the re yes, we can get to the readings now. Our next segment is by Kirk Ramdas. Kirk, are you there? Kirk just stepped away. He just uh -oh. stepped away from the... Um, Oh, he's back. Okay, he's back. Okay. So, Kirk, you now have your, your five minutes. Awesome. Thank you very much. <clears throat> All right. So, thank you very much to the organizers and the sponsors. I really appreciate uh, being in this forum with all these esteemed individuals, and I loved hearing the ideas. So, I want to read two poems that were published in the new issue. Um, and the only thing you really need to know is that I was 
born and lived on Trinidad um, until I was 10 and then I moved to Canada. So these poems uh, explore this. Naparima Hill. Naparima Hill sings to my eyes a song from out of memory. I yearn upon that rock. I feel its shadow over me. Jagged where the rock was quarried before a young nation preserved history. At Naparima's feet, I slept my first decade of sleep. My eyes were closed then. I did not know creation stories are myths. Discovery is a myth. Carib and Arawak are myth. There was one people of many tribes on the continent and the archipelago. One people on Trinidad who rowed their canoes across the water before it was the Gulf of Paria. Before that land was called Venezuela, a pilgrimage to this rock Naparima was happening before the Muslims had Mecca, before the Romans took Jesus as Lord and Savior. The Arawakan blood in my mother's line connects me to this geography. It's not me that remembers. This rock remembers me. Thank you. So that's one poem. I'll just go right to the next one. It's called, thank you, it's called A Mother Plans. An island forged from love of liberty, a single mother sees the path. When she was a girl, Eric Williams galvanized the people, made a roof to shelter the Limer's Republic from imperial yoke. Innocent girl, only a child has enough light to find delight in poverty. All her dreams were love. And when that love turned foul, this island stank like a soursop, seemed small as the seed of a governor plum. Young mother must be strong, must work, must manage not to go berserk. Too much Bacchanal. News comes from the north, phone calls from early explorers who became pioneers, who settle down in Calgary and report that all is well. A mother planned. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kerr. A mother plan? Plans, yeah. The next presenter is Shani de Los Angeles, and she's followed by Mars Ingram. If I don't have to talk so much. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I certainly can. Okay, it's a little lagged on my end. Am I okay? Yes, you're just fine. Okay, so hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, this piece is called When You're in Pain, Just Focus on Somebody Else's Business. Um, and this is about my experience being Dominican American. Um, it was mentioned before about Domin Dominican folks and them understanding themselves in their blackness. And something that I've come to understand about my people is that for those who are in touch with their blackness, it's a very beautiful and profound thing. And I'm trying to change the narrative that um, all Dominicans don't know. Marina taught me how to talk shit. When you in pain, just focus on somebody else's business. And I know they say it ain't healthy to talk so much about what got nothing to do with you, but I can't help myself. With my ears freshly clean, tongue ready to smack, hands bow to clap, I listen in. My mother rolls her eyes when she watches us. Jenny, you know better than to entertain my mother. Now I know my mama really mad when she pronounces my name like that 
And to be honest, I kind of like it. And I know Marina loves it too. Hates that she works so hard just to witness her only daughter escape Hernandez, marry into Bright, ironically, a last name blacking out her entire history. Maybe some lights don't lead the way like they blind you, mommy. Being that my mother fought to be American and only American putting Navas and Puerto Plata in the past, she promised herself to never look back. But when she big mad, damn, that Dominican comes all the way back. Cheney, Cheney, I mean shh, 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 shh. Yes, no matter how hard you try, mommy, there's no denying that Dominican tongue inside. English may sit comfortably in your mouth now, and you proved you could take the girl out the campo, but you can never take the campo out the girl. You can never outrun the first language you learned to tell your mother you loved her. For context, my mother gave me a name my family can't pronounce. The irony, huh? Birthing me with the sound that curses my people's mouth. It's a lot of shame in Shenny. A lot of hiding and running in Shenny. No understanding in Shenny. Just survival in Shenny. Thank you to my family who still try their best. That's what I admire most about Dominicans. They'll butcher my name with a sincere smile on their face, saying the wrong name, but still I receive it the same. Love is what they call me. I love Dominicans. They walk this life not having much, but damn, do they live a life feeling plenty. These are people who twist their own tongue for me, slice every sound they call home, choke themselves outside the rhythm, restricting their blood, desperate just to say my name. Shenny does not rest in their mouth the way it starts a war. Abuela never says my name right, and I don't fault her. Marina has taught me the meaning of sacrifice when she calls out, Nena, she makes me laugh talking about Fulano's mess and with all this hurt in this home, sometime it be the petty shit to bring us all in. And yeah, maybe it ain't healthy, but forget what my white therapist has to say. Let's hear some gossip today. Let's talk some shit in the middle of our hurricane. Call me a hypocrite, but I don't want to unpack no hurt of ours today. Lord, please not today. I just want to laugh today and hear what my crazy ass cousin had the nerve to do today. Thank you. Oh man, very good. Yes, and the delivery was awesome. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so let's, I think the next person, let me pull up my, um, next person is um, uh, Kirk Ramda. Oh, Moss, I, Moss Ingram, I believe. Moss Ingram, I'm sorry, Moss Ingram. And then Thank you. Mac Mahan and Francis McIntyre will be next. Mac Mahan. Thank you. I'm Moss Ingram. It's a huge honor to be here with you today and to uh, have been participating in these in these uh, last two days of this festival. I'm going to be reading from um, volume 32 a short story called Same As It Ever Was. It was always the same. Pedro was a pain in the ass of every man in his bustling little town. And it had always been that way. Ever since he'd become a man so many years ago, and even though he was now old, it was always the same. All the women adored him, and none of the men could understand why, especially when no man could ever even recall hearing him speak. Not so much as a mumble, or murmur. Apart from the rumor that he was mute, he was nothing more than an average in every way, albeit slightly hunched with age, an average height with an average build that leaned toward gangly with average looks. He kept his, ha his hair and nails short. His clothes were always clean and pressed, but he never bathed or showered in his own home if he had one. And when he washed, he washed with regret, washing away the slickness of another woman. Every day he traveled with his razor, and every day he would shave just after he had bathed or showered. Then he would pull on his clean clothes, get in his car, and be on his way. It was always the same. Pedro drove the worst car in town. It was a car that he had been given to by a woman whose husband had died in the war. She had given it to him because she didn't drive and she felt that every man should have a car 
and that he would need a car so that he could call on her again and again. And as she had asked him to, preferring more often than not, he did in keeping to his promise right to this very day. The car was so old and beat up, it was almost unrecognizable and its tires were bald. And in Pedro's town, it was either sunny or raining, but always hot and humid. And his car was always dusty or muddy, depending. It was always the same. Pedro's town was very old, nestled high in the mountains, and most of the roads on the outskirts were perched along steep cliffs and wound around harrowing, harrowing ravines. Some of the roads in town were paved and some were not. But when it rained, all of the roads were slick with mud and clay, and men hoped Pedro would slip out of town right off the mountain, never to be seen again. It usually rained once a day, sometimes all day, and somehow Pedro kept driving her all around town on his bald tires along the muddy roads, never slipping off the mountain, all while barely peering through his sloppy windshield. It was always the same. No one could ruin the mood of men like Pedro. Every morning, the men would gather by the fruit stands at the center of town, where they relished telling their tall tales and complained about the calls from the previous night's game. But Pedro's appearance made them halt mid-sentence and forget everything that they were saying. Some became stern, some sour. Some looked at the ground, some at the sky. But every man was agitated by how Pedro appeared so innocent as if he was not up to something. And how the women who left him appeared so content, why were they so happy? And how all of the men felt neither. What could they do that hadn't been done before? What could they do to justify doing to Pedro, an old man too old to defend himself, an old man incapable of whispering stop or help? Something, anything that would put an end to this injustice. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, we're moving on now to Janine McMahon. Unfortunately, I cannot find Janine McMahon. Okay, and so let's move on to Francis McIntyre. Can't find Francis either. Oh my. Okay. Is there anyone that did not um, present that's here, that, that um, came late? This is the time that we can use this space. Okay. All right. So. Oh. Okay, so that's good. Um, so now we, we, we um, So, so can, I say my, can I say my fourth point from yesterday? No. Nope. 10 lines. What does the audience say? Can we allow that? Because I, you know. Okay, Kirk, Kirk Ramdan is supporting you, so let's go. Okay, it's, it's 30 seconds, less than that. Westward from Elmina, Cape Coast Castle, dark, dingy dungeons, glistening black bodies, humans sold, black gold, steaming squalor, unbelievable horror, unimaginable cruelty, unspeakable inhumanity, waiting ship for Atlantic trip, door of no return beckoning, and it's only the beginning. Hanneman, can you wrap up? Thank you. Mrs. Hanneman, can you wrap up there, please? And then we're going to move yeah. into the response. Okay. Charlie uh, I... and, and Yvette will we'll navigate this last piece here after Mrs. Oh. Hanneman. Okay, I, um, I wanted to, I'm, I'm actually using two devices, Seth, so I'm now looking for, I wanted to read a paragraph from your piece since we have a little time. But unfortunately, if you could do something else, in, give me a second to get to the right page. Yeah, we, could could do do that we, have, we have six minutes left. We have six yeah. minutes remaining going on five. Yes. Okay, thank you, Charlene. So if, if you could do that for me, Sess, just um, give me a second. Adrian, Adrian, me, there's um, something you can play right now. Maybe um, we can do the- Oh, uh, wait, I, 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 um, I found it. Okay, good. I think I found it, but now it's to get to, you know, the, the, 
the I have the success since I have the time and I'm going forward to your presentation that this is absolutely scholarly and erudite work. I have been thrilled with every single presentation. The, um, it gives me so much hope for our society when people continue to write and to bring forward ideas in a context that is, you know, so befitting of the Virgin Islanders that we are. And so I say um, to you that I appreciate so much all of your hard labor. I know you don't like when people do this, but I find it actually very, very important to let you know that what you have done to the Virgin Islands is a very important thing. And so I read this paragraph now from your, your piece and it speaks to this kind of thing. Some of the important things we want to say about graphic representations of the Virgin Islands and her people are cobbled in the ideas we hold about our collective selves. The recent Miss Universe US Virgin Islands controversy sussed, us, sussed many of the ideas about graphic representation now confronting islanders like a boldly in reimagined Marvel series. Graphic artist Shalana Brown's representation of a Virgin Islands face in the ebony image of Miss mm -hmm. Astor Williams on the 2019 via telephone book cover without the benefit of vote or competition is considered without question a Virgin Islands representation. So without a question is the winner of the recent Miss Universe U.S. Virgin Islands competition, who's a six-month white resident of the Virgin Islands, another face, while the latter is the result of an apparently duly vetted popular queen competition, and in the spirit of good sportsmanship, many extend congratulations. The questions that loom are similar to the one asked by Miller's provocative essay. How much time do we have to be in this place to truly represent it? So I turn it over to you now. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that, Mrs. Henneman, for contextualizing the conversation we had earlier. And yes. I'm gonna call on my colleagues. I have to tell you that none of this would be possible without my, the support of people, um, um, Charlene, for one, and the, the LitFest team of, um, include they include, actually right here today we have Yvette and Diane Levance who are constants always there for whatever help we need and then we have a number of other people that, whose name I'm afraid to call and then I leave, I leave people out so there are a number of the team the book bacchanal um, organizer Janice Valman I didn't see her but I think she signed on as Bright Sparks and a, a couple of other people who have always Amina Salim um, we've had Dr. Chinzera over at, at the Cultural Center who would sometimes put people on the radio when they're finished with their presentations. There's a, and, and you know, the UVI staff, Dr. Dr. Hall and the Dean, you know, everybody help us to um, support us and give us the inspiration and the sort of a buoyancy to feel that we, we can go down these paths. So I, I thank you for um, saying that. And I also would like to acknowledge the people who are very important in this um, right here today, we have, we have Matthias Clavier, who today is his anniversary, and, 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 and he has taken the time out of this day, this important day in his, in his life to spend the time with us. And Adrian Wajasa has two um, preschool children that he is, is helping to raise, and he has taken some time out of his time with them as well. So um, we, really, we really appreciate all that everyone is saying, but this is, could not have been possible without the help of all of my colleagues. And um, Biko McMillan went to work today, but he's always on, on call as well. So thank you. Um, uh, Charlene and, um, and, and Yvette, maybe we could talk a little, get some responses from the group here about this experience and the way forward. Anyone get ready to jump in? Okay, well, um... Uh, I'll just read a couple of the responses from the chat. Um, thanks, Elsis and the team for readings, workshop, discussions, and continuing the valuable work of the Caribbean writer. Happy to have been part of it. Um, 
Thank you all sis for all you do. Thank you, a great meeting. Um, let's see here, and somebody says I like that, especially last time I read a poem. Okay, so um, I'd like to thank you, Ms. Brown, for um, being the engine behind moving this local, this here locomotive along, if I can use that imagery, I don't know, is it, is, this is not a local thing, imagery, uh, the bus. You're the engine for the bus. We got buses. I like the local. <laughs> well, yeah, we used to have a local, right? A local line. Well, I, I just like to thank you. You're a bundle of energy and imagination and ideas, and you just go, 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 go. And, you know, I, I, I think that you're an extraordinary individual, an extraordinary educator, you're person, professional, all of these things. I, I, I hope I'm not heaping on enough. Um, and, the work that you do here, it's important, it's impactful, not just here in the Virgin Islands, but in the region and across the world, across the diaspora. I know that's what we, you know, what we reach for every time we put a journal out. And I just want to thank you, as I'm sure others are thanking you as well for the role that you play. Um, it's 5.01, so uh, Dr. Arnold, Okay, thank you, um, Sharon. There are a few others coming in. Um, this has been a wonderful workshop, a lot of ideas of new works to explore and read. Another, I would like, uh, congrats, Alsace and team. I was happy to share. Thanks to everyone for a great get together. Thanks, Alsace. Um, I was introduced to the Caribbean writer by my uncle, Clement White. Thank you for two days of inspiration for us non-writers. And then congratulations, Alices and team. Oh, they, not, they keep coming in now. That was phenomenal. Thank you everyone for presenting Caribbean culture that reaches back to the past and extends forward to the future. Um, it's a great responses, um, Alices, uh, to the past two days. Um, thank you so much. You reached Coastal UK. We are thirsty for this. And I, I am hoping um, perhaps, um, Matthias, you can capture the chat, maybe just copy it and, and so we can go back to it and um, at least have an, an, an maybe use it somehow as an evaluation. I'm thinking maybe we should have had a, an, um, a link that people can just um, click on and give their evaluation, their thoughts. Another just came in, watching new writers has been great. Watching Paul Keynes Douglas was epic and astounding. Okay, and so congratulations, phenomenal weekend. Oh, that's from um, Dr. Sharon Charles. Um, I said she sent me a note yesterday that I sent, I forwarded to you as well. Thank you, Dr. Charles, always there to support. And um, just as we wrap up, um, just uh, a heap of thanks, I guess, as we say here to Alsace and to Charlene. They're the ones who carry the weight of the Caribbean writer. And I don't know if I should call it the weight because it's, the, it's their love, I guess. And uh, the, the rest of us, I know for me, it's just they call on me, but I need you to do this, I need you to do that. Some of us have our specific roles. And so we are called upon, we know that we have to, to, to at a certain time we will be called upon and we respond, do whatever we need to do to get this going. And as the, the, the comments keep coming in, um, I was doubtful this would work by Zoom, but it was amazing. Thank you for all of your hard work, awesome. And um, Alsace, I know everyone has been saying thank you to you and I'm looking at you and I see your face, um, your, your lips twittering and so forth as though you're ready to cry and it's okay, mm -hmm. it's okay, if you, you know, you can breathe, you've done an awesome job. I remember I attended a session um, with Soka Mom Summit back over the, the, Easter, the Easter weekend and they did this 
this forum, this um, platform, they had to shift as well from a face-to-face -to, -face to this. And when I thought I was going to be calling you to say, you know, we can consider such a um, venue or such a platform for this, you were calling to tell me the same thing. So we were like on the right, the, the same page and something that we just ran with. So thank you for your inspiration. Continue. Thank you for your continued love and support and your passion for, not just for the Virgin Islands, but for people as a whole, and uh, for what you bring through this literary forum every year. Not e The hurricanes didn't stop us, and you didn't let the pandemic stop us. I remember the conversations we had back and forth about the pandemic, uh, should we cancel, should we wait? And it was like, no, let's cancel. We don't want to bring people in, but then everything shut down for us, and we didn't have to make that decision. And so here we are. We made a decision. You pushed it forward, and you made it happen. So Thank you so much. I have a comment from a cousin who joined in DC. What an educational feast, real black talent. Paul Keynes Douglas was exceptional. They were all very good. The emotions generated were overwhelming. And I'll end on that note. Well, thank you. And thank you once again to our sponsors, Elaine and Carol. Thank you so much for being just slipping in here and there and helping us out. Really appreciate that. And Althea, you, I see you're still with us from across the miles. And I know it's probably bedtime there, but thank you for sticking with us, Tim. Hello to Anguilla. Thank you for coming and sharing. And Charlene and Matthias, happy anniversary. Um, Moss Ingram, thank you for coming in. And Laurie, I see you're under a tent somewhere. And Paul Keynes, thank you, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I see my neighbor, Phyllis Nielsen, who said, do not call my name. But, um, <laughs> I will tell you that she's very supportive, especially in the walks in the morning when I try to talk about things that we're going to be doing. So I really appreciate everyone that is here. Elisa McKay, that beautiful cover is really a keepsake um, edition. And so you guys enjoy and we hope to have, Matthias has already told me he's going to do a little editing and then we're gonna post this again so that you will be able to share it and be able to view it for a bit. And Paul, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for considering us and for coming. All right. right, so look for this post on the Caribbean Writer website, yes. at least there, but for starters. All right, thank you, That's thank great. you. Have a good evening and be safe. Thank you. Stay indoors, stay on your couches. <laughs> and, and write, write. start write. writing. Write. Remember what Paul write. King said. Yes, write. Okay. okay. All right, you don't have to be any writer, just write. Right. Okay, and we're meeting you all of you. Well, seeing all of you, putting some 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 names to some faces like Moss Ingram, um, you know, I had a different imagination, but so pleased to meet you. Yeah, and, um, Kirk, and Kirk, Kirk Ram Dath, yes. And and yes, yeah, we yes. had Jam we had we had Nelson from India. He was he came in from India. His name was Jamal, or what was his name? Um, Oh, yes, Joshua Nelson. Joshua Nelson. Yes, I wish he had come back today. Yes, yes. I thought he would come back today. He's from India, and it was really nice that we had India in the house. We have Switzerland in the house, United mm -hmm. Kingdom in the house. We have, um, we have, um, there's our Canada. We have Canada. We're, we're, we brought the diaspora together, and yes. so we to congratulate ourselves. And Adrian will be able to tell you what were the top numbers at uh, one point or the other um, for the two days so that you, yes. you have an idea what the attendance was. I know yesterday we were yes. close to 100 at yes. one point. Yes. And today I'm not sure what we have, but um, we, um, Matthias is saying that we may have exceeded 100, but he has to look at those who came in. Right, and in and out. Yes, on. yes. Okay. Well, like um, Shakespeare says, what parting is such sweet sorrow? Such yes. sweet so. sorrow, yes. yes. But we have to we go, part, but it's time. It's yeah, time. but as we part, I'll, say, so I'll put it out there. Maybe we can consider maybe a quarterly forum of this nature, just to, you know, now that you know how to, to do it, you might be able to pull some persons together and just keep this going. I could have put Particularly if we are going to continue in this pandemic for some time. Okay, you don't, get, I could don't have get too happy now. now. Was that answers? If I had bet the person that you would have made that recommendation, <laughs> I would have gotten some money. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you know your team. <laughs> yes, yes, I do. All righty. Okay. Thank you all. Good afternoon. Matthias, enjoy the rest of the evening.
Thank you. Thank Have you. a good day. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, so, uh, good night, everyone. Good night. Yes, good sleep well. Well. Yes, <laughs> she's a bedtime. Yes. Okay. Yes. 99. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Yvette. Dr. Yvette. Bye, Tim. Great to see you. Great to hear you. Okay, all right. Keep writing those poems. They're great. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Bye. 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 I'll see you chat. Bye, y'all.